Hello everyone, I'm feeling extra spooky this week. We are creeping closer and closer to spooky season and I just can't wait. Hopefully, this week's stories put you in that Halloween mood. Let us begin and drift further into Mr. Creep's mind. I'm an astronaut investigating wormholes. Humanity needs to stay away from deep space. Written by... Sniper 6407 In 2019, a deep space anomaly was detected by a satellite 100 miles off the dark side of the moon. It consisted of space matter, dust, and unknown properties, and it had the general appearance of the remnants of a supernova. The object itself was about 100 meters in diameter, with parts of it stretching even further. It was very bright, with hues of green, yellow, purple, and pink. But in the middle, it was pitch black, as if it was a tunnel reaching into the other side of it. Of course, this piqued NASA's interest, and they conducted multiple studies in order to collect data. It was a few months after the initial discovery when NASA detected something very strange. A strange radio signal was detected somewhere in our solar system, and the source and cause were unknown until NASA traced the radio signal back to its source, the anomaly. The radio signal itself consisted of a long, high-frequency sound, changing pitch and volume every few seconds every time in a different order and selection. After the noise was traced and the source was found, NASA made every effort to study the anomaly. They sent a probe to the anomaly, and the probe took samples of the solid matter, the objects near the anomaly, and the materials that seemed to be emitting from the anomaly. Upon further study and investigation, NASA discovered that there was a slight gravitational pull, but instead of pulling any objects near the anomaly to it, the anomaly had an opposite gravitational pull, sending objects out of it. That's when an even bigger realization took place, something that was completely new to human eyes. And despite how insane it sounded, all the data, all the research, and observations concluded that the anomaly was most likely a wormhole. In the history of space exploration, an actual cosmic wormhole had never been photographed or seen, and some even debated on the existence of wormholes. Yet a genuine wormhole was discovered beside the moon. After the probe was sent back to Earth, it was decontaminated, and these scientists and researchers at NASA and the American Space Agency studied and analyzed it. And what these studies concluded were extremely interesting. In some of these solid matter that came out of the anomaly, a meteor particle, there were traces of organic matter on the meteor. At first, these scientists ran tests several times again, but no matter what they did, the conclusion never changed. There was a biological matter on the rocks. And even stranger, the biological matter seemed to come from a living organism. The test did not, and could not conclude what the organism was, but it definitely did not come from anywhere on Earth. And if the anomaly really was a wormhole, then there was a slim chance that the organism the biological matter belonged to did not even come from our universe or plane of reality. In time, after even more funding, a second probe was sent to the anomaly, but not to collect samples and photos, but to go in and through the anomaly itself. The probe was equipped with the best cameras, audio receivers, and fuel that money could buy. After three days of traveling to the location of the anomaly itself, 
the probe arrived within a hundred meters. The video feed the researchers back at NASA received was amazing. They could see the anomaly pulsating and emitting different hues of light, some of which were invisible to the human eye. Once the anomaly reached within 10 meters of the anomaly, the video and audio feed began to get fuzzy and spotty, but it remained functional. The anomaly finally entered the wormhole, and it went through at incomprehensible speeds, traveling through a tunnel that swayed and moved just like the surface of the water. Then, the connection was lost, and the video feed cut out. NASA kept sending probe after probe until the cost of the lost probes was too much, and they had to come up with a better and more efficient solution. The idea of sending an astronaut through the anomaly was immediately shot down. The gravitational waves of a wormhole would immediately crush and kill any living organism that went through. But that was until NASA developed a spacecraft, one that could withstand any type of physical damage, from extreme pressures to gravitational force. NASA also developed a special spacesuit for the expedition. It was made with very durable material, woven together to make it nearly indestructible while keeping the flexibility in the suit. I was involved in the expedition because I was one of the astronauts chosen to go aboard the special spacecraft. The spacecraft itself looked like any other spaceship, but it was equipped with virtually indestructible metals to be able to survive the gravitational waves of an interdimensional wormhole. On January 5th, 2020, I boarded the spaceship, along with another astronaut, Louis. Once we were on the other side of the wormhole, Louis and I were directed to explore whatever was on the other side, using advanced space maneuvering technology and high-tech cameras. And believe it or not, we were also equipped with weapons. The scientists declared that there was a possibility that life was on the other side of the anomaly, whether intelligent or not, could be hostile. So, we were also equipped with tactical ARs, equipped with armor penetrating rounds, and modified to be able to fire bullets in space or gravity in sufficient environments. Since we were astronauts, we didn't know how to shoot military guns, and we had to take a two-day crash course. There was also a risk that we wouldn't come back from the mission alive, but that was a risk I was willing to take. A few hours after the spacecraft took off, the spacecraft got steady enough that we could talk. From how far we were, the wormhole was nothing more than a bright purple blip that was getting closer every passing second. Holy crap, Louis said, talking into the built-in radio in his spacesuit. I can see the anomaly. You excited? I asked. A little, but I'm crapping bricks right now. What do you think we'll see on the other side? Whatever is on the other side, whether friendly or not, I replied. We were now only a mile away from the wormhole, and even from here, it was getting a little hard to keep our eyes open due to the light. We stayed silent for a while until the spaceship was about 50 meters away from the wormhole. My heart was beating out of my chest and adrenaline pumped through every square inch of my body as we approached the wormhole. Before I knew it, the spaceship collided and went into the wormhole, and in an instant, a huge flash of light exploded around us as we went through the interdimensional tunnel at nearly light speed. I felt the pressure and force mound up in my body, and for the longest 10 seconds of my life, I went through the most intense pain I had ever felt. But before I knew it, we had exited the wormhole, and we were on the other side. Dazed, I picked up the radio. Houston, I said. We freaking made it. Only static came back. 
I had partially expected this because we couldn't expect to stay in communication after we had exited the wormhole to the other side. I looked out the window, and for a second, I thought that we were still in our own universe. But then as excitement flooded my body, the small pieces started to click. The planets didn't look bare. They were lush and full of colors. But a lot of the colors were some that I had never seen before, and some colors that I couldn't describe. Once I took in the new universe's features, Louis and I did what we came here to do. They explored one of the habitable planets. We drove the ship down into the orbit of the closest planet. The planet was lush and green, and it was the most similar one to ours. Once we went into the orbit of the planet, I could see the surface and terrain of the planet, and detected that something was wrong. The planet was lush and green, with bodies of liquid and sustained oxygen, and it should have been full of alien life. But there wasn't a single intelligent life form on the planet. The spacecraft landed, and we stepped out, holding out guns at the ready. The planet's air looked, well, very breathable, but I wasn't going to take chances by taking off my helmet. There's something wrong with this place, I said. And what's that? Louis said. There is water, oxygen, and vegetation, but there aren't any intelligent organisms. I was right. There was vegetation, but it was only some kind of moss and a few fern-like alien plants. You're right, Louis said. There's no life here. And then, I spotted something strange in the distance. It was a structure, resembling something like an ancient Egyptian temple, and built out of some unknown material. I showed Louis the structure, and we walked towards it. Upon closer inspection, we saw that it was actually a large doorway leading into a corridor, measuring about 50 feet tall and 20 feet wide. The corridor went diagonally down a staircase built on the diagonal floor of the corridor. The structure was clearly not built by or meant for humans. Each step was one meter apart, and the whole build of the structure was absolutely massive. Should we go in? I asked. Yeah, but keep your guard up. We don't know what's out there. Pfft, obviously. We jumped down each step, holding our rifles, until the last stair led to a very tall, large hallway. There were gigantic hieroglyphics on the ancient walls, depicting giant beings and monsters of hideous and massive proportions resembling giant entities with tentacles, strange appendages and feelers, all attached to a large, fleshy body. In the large temple room, there was an enormous statue of a deity which depicted an enormous creature with enormous eyes covering its body, which consisted of tentacles, legs, and other appendages. There were smaller statues of alien-like creatures surrounding the main statue, seemingly serving and worshipping it. And I have to mention, that when we walked into the temple, we had not made a single sound. But as Louis took pictures of these statues and hieroglyphics, he knocked over a small statue, about ten feet tall behind him, and it fell to the ground and shattered. Immediately, I heard a sliding noise coming from one of the walls, and a hidden door opened, and a hideous creature burst out, screeching and attacking us. It was about 50 feet long, snake-like, but it had no head. Instead, dozens of tooth-filled mouths were all over the creature, snapping and biting at us. It was reddish-green in color, with several tendrils sprouting at the base of the creature's midsection. The creature's mass was made up of rotting flesh, with holes and tendrils. Its tail lashed out to hit me, 
but the armor of my spacesuit luckily protected me, and I stood up unscathed. I shot at the creature, but the bullets only seemed to irritate it. Louis screamed, unloading his magazine into the creature. We quickly climbed up the massive stairs and ran out of the underground temple as the creature pursued us. I had never run so fast in my life, and I almost threw up in my spacesuit. But if we had stopped running, the creature would have killed us. We got in the spacecraft and took off, just as the creature caught up to us. As we ascended into the sky of the planet, I looked down and saw something enormous emerge from underground and ripped apart the creature that had been pursuing us. Nearly in orbit, we could see that the entity was at least 40 miles large, and it was identical to the creature the enormous statue had depicted. We were never meant to explore other universes, of what other untold cosmic horrors lie beyond our reach. I hope we never find out. It Lurks When It's Dark and Rainy Written by Insomniac Writer It was the first day of summer break. I was officially done with all my finals and luckily, all of them went pretty well. But of course, it couldn't be perfect as the rain poured heavily, painting faint lines on the window's glass as it seeped down. I checked the weather forecast and to my disappointment, it announced that it was going to rain all day and most likely all night as well. So, having no other choice, I decided to binge watch Netflix all day. I powered through half of the second season of Money Heist, but I got bored so I switched the TV onto a music channel and decided to hop on my PC. I didn't even notice how fast time flew by, and before I knew it, it was 10pm. I decided to take a break and eat something since I didn't eat anything after breakfast. I went and made some french fries along with some bacon and came back to my room. I placed the plate on my desk and right as I sat down, the music channel was interrupted by a loud man speaking, scaring the soul out of my body. We are sorry to interrupt your program, but as you already know, the storm isn't clearing up anytime soon. Please do not go anywhere starting from this point on, as it's dark and make sure that all the windows and doors to your home are locked. We also recommend shutting off all the blinds and curtains and whatever you do, do not answer your door, no matter who the person outside says he is. After this, the music program came back up as if nothing had happened. Well, this is weird. All of these precautions for some measly summer storm, I thought to myself. And despite my suspicions, I did as the man said. And before I did though, I took a look out one of my windows. Outside, the gloomy night was accompanied by big drops of water pouring from the sky, while the street lamps barely illuminated the streets, making up for an eerie scene. Getting chills, I closed and locked the window, covering it with a curtain. I did the same thing for every window before checking the time again, 11pm. I decided to eat dinner, take a shower and go to bed, which is exactly what I did. I woke up in the middle of the night, about 2am. Opening my eyes, I slowly got adjusted to the darkness surrounding me. I yawned stretching my arms upwards and scratching my head. It was awfully hot in my room for some reason, so, half asleep, I decided to crack open a window. Doing so, I heard thunder and rain, still pouring, and then I remembered what the man had told me hours ago. I shut the window quickly as a sudden rush of adrenaline overtook my body, completely waking me up. Now I can't sleep. Great, I said to no one in particular. I switched the light on and powered my PC. It was going to be a long night. I checked my phone for any messages and, surprisingly, 
there were notifications from uh, one of my friends. I had five missed calls from him and a ton of messages. Oh dude, this storm is crazy, was the first message, and the others got more chaotic as they went on. It went from saying how crazy and how unbelievably long lasting it is to, screw me man, it bit me and now it's waiting by my door, it's scratching at it like a wild dog. All I did was go on the porch for a sig and it caught me. Whatever you do, listen to the news reporter. He is not kidding. I tried calling 911, but it says the line is occupied every time. I guess I'm not the only one in this situation. After this, no other messages followed, and he was last online at 1 a.m. What the heck? Who bit you? What's going on? I texted him in a rush, but got no response. That's when I realized something isn't adding up. Summer storms usually last a couple of hours and are not this heavy hitting. Unlike this one, and whatever bit my friend may be involved with it. Despite all of this, I tried calming down, tricking my mind into thinking that my pal made it to the hospital and is now resting, which was hard to believe but I do have something to hold my sanity. I loaded up a game and played it for some time before blacking out. I awoke with a jump, sweaty and dizzy. I checked the time, 1pm. I didn't bother cleaning myself or dressing. I immediately checked my windows. To my surprise, the storm was dropping the biggest water drops I've ever seen. I had seen a huge thunderbolt hit the ground on the horizon, its sound echoing in my head like an apocalypse siren. There was something else though. Everywhere in the street, there were military cars and black armored trucks. A small military outpost was made outside and men with guns stood around. I think I even heard a few giving orders. What the heck is going on? I asked myself. But before I could even think of an answer, loud banging came from my front door. If anyone is home, open the door right now or else I'll kick it down. A shout came. I almost opened the door before remembering the news message. I decided to look out the window first. Indeed, my guess was right. It was a military guy. I'm coming right now. I yelled back, mostly to stop him from breaking down my dang door. The banging stopped and I opened the door. What's going on? I asked, still kind of sleepy with my plate full of questions. Too dang much to explain, sighed the man. He didn't want to be here at all and I knew that from his tone. Well, I got time since I don't think I can go anywhere seeing you guys here, I said, opening the door more, to take a look around but also to invite him in. Hey, thanks for the offer, but I got a lot more people to go to. What you need to know is that the town is sealed off from outsiders. Basically, nothing is coming in and nothing is going out. Do you have enough food and water to last you for a couple of days? The man finished with a question. It was so much more information at one time that it took me a minute to process. Meanwhile, the man waited, tired, for a response. Yeah, I got enough, but what's going on? My friend had texted me last night about something biting him on his porch. You better start grieving, the man said, turning his back to me as he walked away. Asshole, I whispered before shutting my door. And now I had even more questions and even less answers. What is out there? What could possibly be that bad to involve the military and some unknown personnel? The other guys didn't look like spec ops to me. I had to find out and so, as stupid as it sounds, I decided on sneaking out that night. I had to find some answers. I had no plan though. My only plan was seeing or hearing something that could give me answers and not get caught. And so, I spent the rest of my day waiting for a reply from my friend, but I got nothing. I even tried calling him, but it always went to voicemail. He wasn't from this town, a couple of towns over, but he was here visiting his family. We had grown up together, but he decided to move when he got into college. Where he moved it was closer to him than if he had stayed here. 
Anyway, nighttime came, and I put my plan into action, slightly cracking the door open to take a peek. The storm was still taking place, like it was a part of everyday life. I looked around to see if anyone was surveying or patrolling around, and indeed, a military dude and one of the armor guys were chatting, having a smoke break. I took my chances, running into the cold and dark night, behind a car where they couldn't see me. I had black track pants and a black jacket, being basically invisible if I made my moves correctly. That didn't last long. I checked my phone. 11 p.m. I moved from the car behind a camo green tent, and I heard voices. So what is this thing? Is it a skin? A wendigo? We have yet to find out, and that's why we've been sent here. What we do know is that it's not large. It's actually pretty small compared to the other things. But it moves quickly and bites to kill. We only have one case of a person being bitten. His wife said that he went to smoke. Josh, I thought to myself. The thing bit him, and as we took samples for him, we found poison in his blood. Poison? Uh, like venom? Another voice asked. Yeah, like venom, but stronger than a cobra's. The guy died shortly after being flown to the hospital. Crap, we have to get these people out of here. I tried convincing Bossman to give us permission to, but he said, not yet. Asshole. You can say that again, the first voice said. The conversation ended. I heard them shuffling and guessing that they were leaving the tent shortly. I moved quickly behind the car again. I now knew what they were trying to hide from us, and I also knew that I needed to get the heck out of here before all hell broke loose. I decided to go back inside my house, but before I could do so, I felt a heavy touch on my shoulder. Don't turn around, kid. I'm searching you. Groaned a voice from behind me. Crap, I whispered. And before I could prepare myself mentally, my whole world went black, like a bag was placed over my head. Out of instinct and being scared out of my mind, I tried fighting it, but my strength was nothing compared to the grip the man had on me. Me easy, easy. We don't want you to hurt yourself. Now turn around and walk with me. I'll make sure you won't run into anything. Maybe. He ended the sentence with a chuckle. I walked for what seemed like eternity before I was set down. The bag or whatever was on my head was taken off and I was in a car. Most likely one of those heavy trucks. Everyone had their faces covered, so I couldn't see them. Now, before anyone gets angry, what did you hear? A voice boomed suddenly. Nothing, man, I swear. I didn't hear anything. I pleaded, scared for my life. The guy who asked me sighed, tired, before he asked me again. What did you hear? His voice got more serious. I looked around and seeing that I had no other choice, I told them everything that I knew. I felt the tension in the air, like gravity was crushing me between it and the ground. You're going to forget everything you heard and you will sign this paper, agreeing that you won't talk to anyone about this conversation, or the one that you heard. You got it? A rough tone asked rhetorically, while handing out a sheet of paper. Having no other option, I signed it and right as I was about to hand it back, I heard yelling outside. It's here, it's here. Get around, everyone. A desperate yell came. I felt all eyes on me. Stay here and do not move. Listen to orders, at least this time. The men said before running out of the truck quickly. I wasn't tied up. They're a mistake. Did I listen to them? Well, yes, for a few minutes. Between those few minutes, it was complete silence. Like the whole world had stopped moving. Then all hell broke loose. I heard shooting and screaming from everywhere around me. It bit me. The thing bit me. Help. I heard a man yell. Not long after, the truck's doors flew open while three guys were carrying a wounded one. I felt like a deer in headlights when they stared at me. What's the dang civilian doing here? One man asked, no one in particular. He was caught sneaking on us to get info. He signed a paper though. 
A bitten guy sat through huffs and puffs, trying to breathe. And that paper won't make him forget you, idiot. Another man scolded the wounded. It's burning. My whole body is burning. Help me for sake. The wounded guy yelled again. He was bitten on the neck. Three big dots leaked blood quickly while the light from his eyes faded slowly, like fog on a sunny day. We're losing him. He's bleeding out. The third voice howled. We already lost him. And we're losing everyone else too. We have to get out of here. No, we have to take it down. If it reaches the city, everyone's done for. Everyone nodded, agreeing to this. All of this went down in front of me, like a movie played on tape. I felt a lump in my throat as my fight-or-flight instincts kicked in. Everyone looked at me again. You ever shot a gun before? One asked, looking towards me. I shook my head from side to side, the scaredness and nervousness preventing me from speaking. Well, I guess there's a first time for everything. Take this rifle. The man threw the dead guy's rifle to me. Just don't fully auto it or you'll take your shoulder off. And try your best to hit the creature and not your own team. Shocked, scared, and with adrenaline pumping through my veins like steroids, I nodded, cocking the gun. I have seen a few movies and, since I was a bit of a nerd, I learned about them from the internet. Among other things like wars, insects, and more. Anyway, I ran with the guys out of the truck. It was like a battlefield. People ran around frantically, screaming for help, crying, some were even dead, crushed or bitten. Children could be heard crying and screaming as they were confused, scared and traumatized while the gunfire added more to it. I looked around to see what we were shooting at, and when I saw it, I simply froze. My blood did as well that my feet were glued to the ground. Moving around was about a four-foot, nine-legged thing destroying everything that it touched. Cars, houses, poles. It was dark as heck, but the gunfire lit the area like a firework show, revealing more features of Satan's pet. It was hairless and bloody, full of holes from all the bullets, but it didn't seem like it had affected it much. Worse, it seemed like they made it angrier. The storm was still pouring, now more than ever, as thunder could be heard everywhere. It was truly a living hell. The creature also had a small torso on top of the legs with two clawed-ended hands shredding everything. Its face. God, its face was the most terrifying part. It had five eyes, all red and all looking everywhere. The mouth was bloody, iron taste looked with painting its fangs and a deep red. The creature kept getting closer and closer while some soldiers around me ordered people to move and run past them. They were trying to save as many as they could. The cold night, accompanied by the heavy rain, brought me back. Feeling the rifle in my hands and full of rage, I started shooting, trying hard not to fully auto it. The next events are a blur more than anything, but I remember the creature slowly losing power in life. At one point, it got on top of me as I got distracted by a car that flew right past me. And despite the creature being small, it had an insane amount of power. It took me in one of its claws, moving me around like I was on a crappy carnival ride. I felt a sharp pain as the claw made its way into my body. It had unbelievable strength. It almost bit me before it just fell. The bullets were finally taking effect. The thing shrieked with an inhuman and high-pitched voice, making my ears hurt. It was like chalk on a blackboard, but a thousand times worse. It dropped me down, hitting me to the concrete. That's when I blacked out completely, most likely from the impact. I awoke in a hospital, screaming for her to let me go. Medical staff ran in to check on me. After they made sure that I was okay and calm enough... They left me and three other men and came in. They all looked at me smiling. One heck of a job, kiddo, I gotta admit. One of them said while the other two nodded. Thanks, I guess, but what happened? I weakly asked. They looked at themselves, doubting if they should tell me or let me live with the memory loss. They told me everything that I told you above. After they ended the memory, it all seemed so surreal. Like it was a fever dream. I wanted to believe it. 
I really did, but deep down I knew that this was the harsh reality. They also added that the town is out of all maps, and everyone who was rescued was forced to sign the same paper that I did. Basically, making everyone believe my town never even existed. The media won't write any of this either, as it's all covered up. So, you can't believe me for my word or not. They also told me that I had a great potential, and with some training, I could become a valuable member for the team. I agreed to the offer. You may wonder why, and Josh is one of the reasons. I'll end all creatures for Josh. I'll take revenge for him, his family, and everyone else who died that dreadful night. And that's where I am now. I'm still in the hospital for a few broken things, but I've been told that I'll recover well. I got a contract with the government facility, and I got a well-paying job now. It's risky, but I don't really care anymore. I lost everything that night. My friends, my house, and my dog. They bought me a new house with everything I needed and asked. I wasn't greedy. Ending this, I have one more thing to say to all of you. If a heavy storm comes and you hear a warning from the TV, don't try to be a hero. You may not be as lucky as I was. My friends and I made a game of Stalking Strangers. Written by Finn901013. When I was a teenager, me and my friends used to play a lot of dare games. My hometown is small, suburban, great for young families or old people, but agonizingly dull for teenagers. So, as you can imagine, we had a tendency to take things a little bit too far. My friend Tom almost got hit by a train when Sophie dared him to dash across the tracks. Jess was sick for weeks after drinking from a stagnant pond we had found in the woods. Our competitive spirit was stronger than any sense of self-preservation. And each time we cheated death, we were only driven to try something even more stupid. Now, this is going to sound weird, but one game we like to play involved us stalking random strangers from around town. We would pick a random person from the crowds in the high street and follow them as they went about their day. Sometimes we would catch them doing something weird or even borderline criminal but most did no more than visit a few shops before getting on a bus and heading home. The fun was mainly in the danger of getting caught. We never did though. In fact, we were starting to get bored of it by the time this story I'm about to share took place. We always would follow at a safe distance making up funny stories about the clueless victim's life and personality. I mean, really, how often do you turn around to check if anyone's following you? You would never think to, right? One day, it was just me and Jess hanging out in town. She had suggested that we play, and I reluctantly agreed. I told her to choose our target. She looked around, and then smirked as her eyes fell on the perfect candidate. Let's follow old Mags. What? No. That didn't feel right. Even though none of our targets ever discovered what we were doing, we had an unspoken agreement not to follow anyone. I don't know. Vulnerable? We had seen this man around town plenty of times, just stop still and staring into space, or aggressively rattling a door handle a minute before a shop opened up for the day, and definitely mentally ill. 
in a small town, you tend to see these same people around on the street. And boredom brings out the worst in people. All the local drunks and unchecked ill had dumb nicknames that all the locals used. So, typically cruel, he was called Mags because he looked like a you-know-what. He had a face that made you double-take and then look away embarrassed. I never could tell if he was deformed by some genetic condition or just incredibly ugly. He was right in the border between ordinarily unfortunate and categorically wrong. His whole head looked stretched out. His beady little eyes were too handless above his thin mouth. His thin cranium towered way too high, and his skin was an unhealthy gray-white. When Jess suggested that I was scared of him, I was. I felt that I had no choice but to agree to target him. We followed him for a few hours, while he drifted around the town, stopping and staring, then moving on suddenly, as if he had remembered he had to be somewhere, only to halt on another street. He entered a supermarket, made a loop of the aisles, and then left again. At one point, he cursed and tried to kick an unsuspecting pigeon, which made Jess laugh a little. I couldn't see what was funny about it. His actions, they were meaningless. It was all quite sad, really. Finally, he started walking away from the town center. He's going home, said Jess. I wonder where he lives. I hope he doesn't live alone, I said, but she ignored me. We followed him down a tree-lined road, past old terrace townhouses. I was somewhat satisfied to learn that he lived in a posh area. We kept a distance of around 50 meters. As the roads were so long and straight, there was really no risk of us losing him. Oh crap, said Jess, as we watched him turn and walk up a garden path. We got him. We kept walking, moving closer as he came up to the door. I remember a weird thudding as we approached. I couldn't decide if it was a vibration in the ground or the blood in my temples. Jess didn't seem to react, so I suspected an oncoming migraine. Max was holding a slip of paper, a missed delivery notice. As it happened, the postwoman was still within view, far ahead down the road. Clearly, he had noticed, because as we closed the distance and came within 10 meters of his house, he dashed back down his garden path and down the road to catch up with her. As I looked at the front door that he had left open, my head throbbed painfully. We stopped outside of the house and I knew what was coming. I dare you to go inside. Screw off, Jess. That postwoman's miles away. You've got at least five minutes. Go in for one minute. See what kind of hellhole Mags lives in. And you're in the lead. And it's even enough for you to overtake Sophie in the scoreboard. That made me pause. Sophie's lead had been untouchable since she had flashed her boobs at one of our school's teachers. We all knew that it would take something wild to get back in the running. I was young and stupid. I had turned my mind off, walked confidently up the path, and slipped inside. The hallway air was heavy, with a light smell of paint. 
The absolute silence quickly settled my doubts. No one else lived here. It was an oppressive silence. Without even a clock ticking, or any electronics humming. But the interior was mundane. There were discarded envelopes on a side table. The walls were a conventional off-white. The staircase had a decorative hardwood banister leading up to... Okay. There was the first strange thing. The top of the staircase was completely blocked off. The gap was stuffed with fabrics. You know, bed sheets, cushions, clothing, floor to ceiling, wall to wall. It was jammed so densely, even air couldn't pass between floors. I knew Max wasn't right in the head. What could have possessed him to do this? I have no idea. The hallway to the right of the staircase ended in a door. And there was another door in the wall right of that. The far door was ajar, and as I moved closer, a cool draught told me that there was an open window somewhere within. In fact, the air felt restless, displaced, in a way that didn't match the narrow room. I wish I had had the sense to leave then. It had been long enough to complete the dare, but I crept on through the far door. The next room was pitch black. There was a chalky smell to it, and my steps echoed strangely at the doorway. I couldn't find a light switch, so I waited for my eyes to adjust. When I did, I felt sick with vertigo. I was standing on a ledge. Just beyond the doorway, the floor stopped and a deep pit yawned before me. I took in the details. Somehow, the normality of the room at my level made it stranger. A white plaster ceiling, heavy curtains closed over a window. The walls were clean of dust and neatly wallpapered and then below the baseboard where the floor should be. The world just fell away. Bricks and concrete foundation led down into darkness. How deep did it go? I dug through my pockets and found some loose change. I held a penny out above the dark and I let go. It fell and fell and I waited. I never heard it meet ground, but as I strained my ears, the pulsing started up again inside my inner ear. My legs started to shake and I clung tight to the door frame, picturing myself falling in, but I didn't move. I was dumbfounded by what I was seeing. The vibrations were messing with my balance. It was like I was affected by a sound but one too deep to actually hear. My eyes probed the dark for more information. There seemed to be a reddish tone to the blackness, or maybe there was just too much blood swilling around my sinuses. And then I saw something. Two points catching the light. Wet curved, reflective eyes. In the pit... Someone was quietly looking back at me. I determined to make out more of the face, but the eyes were all that could reflect light. I don't know how long we stared at each other. I can't imagine what the hell they were doing down there. Looking back, none of it makes any sense. It's been years and I want to dismiss it as a weird dream, but the memory is too vivid. I snapped out of the staring match when my phone started vibrating. Jess was calling me, which meant only one thing. Old Mags was coming back home. 
I stepped away from the pit and sucked in air as though coming up from underwater. Through the open doorway, on the bright street outside, was Mag's stark, stretched out face. His white forehead was a glistening in the sun. It felt like my heart had ruptured. There was one more door I hadn't been through. My last hope for escape. My hands trembled around the handle, but I managed to open it quietly, and I found myself in a living room, just as I had heard old Mag's boots in the hallway. I went to the windows, jumping at the sound of the front door slamming shut. The window opened wide, thank God, and I hopped out into the front garden. I didn't look back. I jumped the wall and sprinted away. I clocked Jess sitting at a bus stop on the other side of the road. Eyes wide, but sensibly staying where she was. To bolt would make her guilty. I ran until I couldn't go any further. Jess had no choice but to ride the bus away from the scene of the crime. She had met me back near the center of town later on. Her expression seemed grim. We didn't talk about the dare game points. She just assured me that I had been out of sight before she saw old Mags come into his living room. I didn't want to talk about what was in the house, and she didn't push the topic. After this incident, the dare stopped. How I Became a Monster Hitman Written by 02321 Hours away left of 1999, it felt like the entire world held their breath, waiting for the world to come crashing down because of a computer bug. I was convinced I was not going to live to see the new year, and wished it was for the same reason the rest of the world was worrying about. On that night, I found myself in a dimly lit warehouse, tied to a chair, desperately trying to get out of this situation alive. My father was a no-good son of a gun that brought down everyone who came into contact with him. I was glad to be away from him at the moment that I was able. The only good thing he ever gave me was a bit of advice that kept me alive during my adult life. It doesn't matter if you have Jack. You just need to convince people that you have something that they need. And that's exactly what I did. I conned people into thinking that I was the right person for the job. Faking skills to get paid until I either learned said skill then and got bored of the job and moved on, or got caught and fired. Soon I found myself not able to find respectable work that paid enough to keep me living. Slowly, I started doing more and more little jobs on the wrong side of the law. It was a creeping downward slide. I didn't notice just how far down I had gotten until I hit rock bottom. I was running too many plans. Too many promises to too many people. It only took one thing to slip up for me to land in boiling hot water and it finally happened. I was jumped while walking to a bar, beaten up and blindfolded. The long trip spent in a trunk of a car unable to get free. I tried sweet talking my captors, giving them more promises I swore that I could keep, until I was forced into a rough wooden chair and strapped down. The moment the blindfold came off, I knew that I wasn't going to leave that building in one piece. I have many bosses, but the man before me was the toughest and meanest of the bunch. My sweet talking skills may have gotten me the job at first, but it was not good enough of a skill to get me out of the mess that I was in. I owed him money that I did not have. That was it. That was all the facts. I should accept it but I just couldn't. 
I needed to believe in a good outcome or else I really had no chance. No matter what I promised and said in my sweetest of tones, I was still worked over. I was alive so I thought that he must have thought that I had something of worth. I feared what would happen when they found out that I had no girlfriends or sisters that I could sell out. No hidden money or a crappy card in my name. I didn't even own my own fridge. If I ever moved out from my apartment, it would stay with my penny-pitching landlord. The only way they could make money off me was to sell my organs. My blood type was a rare universal kind that meant anyone could use it for transfusions. In my darker times, I sold my blood to get by and that's how I knew. I wondered if that meant my organs could be used by more people and therefore be worth more. I didn't want to find out. Boss, I keep telling you, I didn't lose your money, I just invested it. If you give me till the end of the month, I'll get it back in triple. If you off me tonight, you'll really be getting nothing. I said as coolly as someone who was strapped to a chair with a broken nose and a broken set of fingers could speak. That massive man of pure intimidating muscle did not look moved by my offer. Even with all the pain that I was in, I felt annoyed. Are you going to kill me or not? Doing this isn't going to get your money back, so just let me go or be done with it. I don't think he's worth the time. We should just feed him to that thing and be done with it. One of the grunts said looking at me in disgust. What thing? I knew the boss that I made the foolish mistake of borrowing money from like cats. Big cats. No one knew the number of illegal black market pets that he owned. He liked them scattered throughout the country for safekeeping. Honestly, being eaten by a lion or a tiger was almost neat enough of a way to be killed that I almost didn't mind. Almost. The boss looked over at the man who suggested it, and then back at me deciding on my worth. Triple. I stammered out but deep down I knew what my future held. Yeah, I'm done with him. Bring that thing in and make sure there isn't a mess left behind, the boss said. Giving a wave and walking away completely, ignoring me and begging for him to just stay and listen. I was frantic, almost out of my mind from fear. I started talking to the two men who stayed behind while the third went off to get whatever beast that was about to make me a nice dinner. Come on, don't do this. I wasn't kidding about the money. If I can get this much in just a few days, just think of how much I can get in the future. You won't need to work for the boss anymore. Think about it right. In a few months, you can just retire somewhere nice and hot and the girls are dirt cheap. Isn't that the best idea you ever heard? I kept chattering on hoping that if I threw everything to the wall, something just might stick. When the other man came back dragging a creature on a chain, it shut me up. Nothing had ever shut me up in my entire life, but this did. I stared. My body turned to ice and mouth was open in mid-word at the monster that had been literally dragged into the light. It was a double the size as the lion I expected to see, dark and, strangely enough, flickering. It walked on all fours, massive claws leaving deep tears in the solid concrete. The chains around its neck looked perfectly real and solid, but this thing just kept going in and out of focus, like I was never meant to see it. As if those chains not only were dragging it along towards me, but also dragging it into our world. It fought hard against the chains that left a deep wound where they touched its skin. The beast let out a loud roar of protest, but that too sounded unreal and out of focus. It had a mane of dark fur that at some point must have been a proud feature of a glossy black. But now, it was just a matted and dull. A sheet was over the top of its head, leaving only a snout of jagged teeth exposed. Seeing the countless scars etched into the poor thing's body, I felt as if we were both in the same boat, caught and tortured by these things. After seeing it, I was still afraid of whatever supernatural creature that had just been dragged in front of me, but I also felt sorry for it. I wanted to do something, anything to help it even though I was not in the position to do so. Come on, you overrated mute. Behave. We have a nice snack for you. Eat him and you can go back to your cage. The man grunted, trying to drag the thing even closer. With a quick jerk of its head, 
The beast tore the chain from the man's hands for a few seconds. The other two ran in and helped him get the monster under control. It shrieked again, just wanting to be free of them. One peeled away to grab my chair from behind to drag me closer. The chair legs made a horrible sound across the ground, like nails on a chalkboard. I tried making it difficult for him, but in the end, I couldn't do a dang thing as my chair was placed within reach of the dark monster. The monster stopped struggling when I got closer. It could smell my blood and I knew it. Its nose got right up close, nearly touching me as I felt hot puffs of air ruffle my hair. I expected it to smell horrible, but oddly enough it smelled almost minty. It would only take one bite to end me. I really hoped that my head got taken off first and not my legs to suffer through being eaten alive. Suddenly, the idea of being chopped down by some powerful animal didn't feel like a neat way to go out at all. It just felt like the end. Drips of drool came from its mouth and dropped onto my jeans, soaking them through. It made my skin crawl. I tried backing up the chair only to see a man was holding it in place. Come on now, eat him. That's an order. Those words made the monster tense. Before, it just looked curious about me, but now, it looked like a cat ready to pounce. It now had orders and it needed to obey them. I was hoping that what feeling was because it drooled on me and not because I had peed myself seeing the sudden change. I was so out of my mind in fear that I didn't even stop and think what the heck this thing even was. A crushing forest came down on each of my arms as I was strapped to the chair as the beast placed huge claws on them to stand up. Those countless teeth just above my head and jaw opening ready to take one massive bite. In my last moments, I wanted to pray but couldn't find any kind of thoughts in my head. I took a large inhale waiting for death to come. To my shock, I didn't get my head torn off. Instead, the monster turned that deadly set of teeth on the man holding my chair from behind. The dark fur covered my vision. I only guessed he had gotten his head bitten off instead of myself, when screams of surprise and fear came from the other men. A flurry of motion started. The beast was dragged back, the claws digging into the flesh on my arms leaving cuts, but also snapping the restraints that were keeping me down. My body moved before my mind did. My bleeding arms shot down trying to get my legs free as I kept darting my head up to see the other two men trying to get control of the monster. One pulled a gun from who knows where and started shooting. The monster took some hits but darted away so the one holding the chains received some friendly fire. The man collapsed and the dark creature was free. It thrashed, slamming into wooden boxes surrounding us. Packing peanuts, coffee grounds, and what I guessed to be bundles of drugs poured out. I really didn't care. I just had to get the heck out of there. These straps on my legs felt nearly impossible to undo. Because of the noise, more people came rushing in, trying to first catch the monster. Soon, they knew that it wasn't possible and they started to shoot at it. The entire scene was chaos and I was trapped in the middle of it. The gunshots going off were deafening. I'm sure the monster was making noise of its own, but I couldn't hear anything beyond the gunfire ringing in my ear. Men were getting ripped apart while they tried shooting that creature down. Wooden crates exploded into pieces flying around almost as dangerous as the bullets. It was a miracle that I wasn't shot when I was just sitting out in the open and trying to get free. Another miracle happened. I got my legs out of the straps and started to try and run off into a direction away from the bullets and the beast. But my luck ended there. I started running on unsteady feet towards a tower of crates to hide behind. A man turned the corner into the fight, knocking me right over. He was middle-aged with white hair and he had no weapon. I was so pissed that he kept me from escaping. I burned the image of his face into my mind as I fell. And then the beast came closer to me. It was only a few feet away, but that meant bullets in my direction. What came next made it feel like everything just froze. I was glued to the ground, on my back, looking in the direction of the monster. The man with the white hair had his arm outstretched, with a look of concern and worry on his face. 
The monster had its head turned to look at something that was just tossed towards it. I didn't hear the explosion from my ears already being shot, but I felt the shockwave of my head hit against the concrete floor so hard that it knocked me out. There was no way to know how long that I was out from it. A few seconds or a few minutes. My ears rang and my body was so stiff. I couldn't move so I just tried looking around to see what had just happened. Debris from the small explosion were scattered around. The overhead light flickered, making it hard to see clearly. For how much my head hurt, I was thankful for the brief stints of darkness. In these small few seconds of light, I saw the white-haired man go over to the creature carefully removing the chains. The monster looked as bad as I felt. Both back legs had been torn off. Countless injuries and bullet holes marred the dark fur. Even as I was on the ground, unable to move my head and body, with my head pounding, I felt bad for the thing. Whatever it was, it didn't feel right it was harmed so badly and most likely going to die. Don't move, I'll do what I can. I was shocked to hear the man's voice. I shouldn't have been able to hear anything so clearly after that gun battle and explosion. As much as I disliked him from knocking me over and causing me to get caught up in the shockwave, I had to admit, he sounded like a nice person. He sounded so worried, as if he was talking to an old friend. Do not bother with me, my king. This was my mistake. Wash your hands of this. That monster spoke. The tears came to my eyes. I couldn't stop them. That terrifying yet injured creature almost sounded like a hurt child trying to act brave. That man, he was taken like myself. Can you save him? That was strange. Was the beast talking about me? I tried sitting up to get a better look, but my body didn't move. The white-haired man looked over in my direction. I could have sworn that he clicked his tongue when he looked at me. No, he should already be dead. Humans cannot heal from vast injuries like that. Unlike you, if we could just get some virgin blood or flesh to patch you up, then maybe. The man trailed off, sounding as if his hope for the dark creature living was fading, when he saw just how badly it was hurt. I didn't want to think about what he had just said about me. How I had less hope than the beast before me. Using every ounce of willpower that I had, I looked down at myself. He was right. I really should have been dead already. My legs twisted and broken, arm torn off and chest full of bleeding and ragged holes. How in the heck was I still awake? I tore my eyes away from my broken body and looked over at the two in front of me. I really wasn't going to make it out alive, but I could still do something. I tried speaking, only to cough and nearly choke on my own blood. I couldn't speak. Maybe they could sense it though. The embarrassing fact that after living a life of crime, I was still untouched in a sense. If they needed virgin blood, they could take mine. You can laugh at the idea of me being so old-fashioned of saving myself for marriage. The thing I discovered about my life early on is almost everything is out of my control. I was never going to live an easy life born the way that I was, into the family that I was raised in. No matter how hard I tried, my type never got anywhere in life. It was all beyond my control. So, I was so desperate trying to find things about myself that were entirely up to my own decisions. Not sleeping around was one of them. If you want it, take it. I thought hoping they could hear me the same way that I could hear them. I felt cold. My eyelids were fluttering shut no matter how hard I tried keeping them open. Dang, I wish I wasn't so damn cold at the end. That was it. I was going to die because I listened to my father's advice on life. He never really did leave me anything worthwhile now, did he? I let myself be overtaken by endless darkness expecting to never wake up again. But for some reason, I did wake up. I had to be dreaming. My body felt stiff but whole. I didn't know where I was. I didn't recognize the room in the slightest. A hospital room would make sense, not a high-end penthouse bedroom. I didn't move for the longest time trying to understand what the hell happened. 
Did I dream the entire thing? That must be it. There was no way that I could have survived those injuries. And yet, it felt too real to just be a dream. Sitting up in the bed, I looked down to see that I was dressed in very silky and very expensive sleepwear. I could save for a year and still not be able to afford these. Lifting the shirt up, I inspected my body for scars or medical treatments. A lamp was on my bedside, giving me enough light to see by. Looking down, I didn't think this could be my body. I was never fat because I could never afford to eat, but I never had a six-pack before. Alright, it might not have been a six-pack, but it was way more tall than what my skinny body was before. I stared at it, and then noticed my nails. Each long and pointed like those ugly things women pay to have. I had to see my face, just to make sure that I was still myself. Stumbling out of bed, I slowly made my way over to the bathroom on the other side of the vast, plush room. Flicking the light on, I gave myself a good look over here. My face looked the same, just healthy as if I was getting the right amount of sleep and eating good meals. I've never looked like this. My hair was dyed a dark black instead of a mousy brown color that I hated, and my eyes looked more golden than the brown that matched my hair in the past. Aside from the eye and hair color change, I looked about the same. A noise from inside the penthouse made me nearly scream. I jumped, crashing into the sink behind me. I couldn't find a weapon. Whatever was going on, I had to get the heck out of here. Someone else was here and I didn't want to stay and find out who. Creeping along the place felt like a castle. I shuddered to think of how much just renting it for a month would cost. Even with all my efforts going into not being spotted, a man that I recognized came peeking out from the kitchen as I tried to make it as far away from this place as I could. Mason, I made you coffee and I can order some food. Go sit down. The white haired man from before said to me. My knee jerk reaction was to book it. This man knew my real name, not the false ones that I've been using for years. I wanted to tell him to stuff it and that I was leaving. You really shouldn't have. My voice spoke but I wasn't in control of it. Nor was I controlling my body when it obeyed the man and sat on a couch in the living area. On the inside, I was screaming, all sorts of protest, trying to make myself move. But on the outside, I was acting like a good little boy sitting and waiting. Finally, the man sat down, setting a tray with two cups of sugar and cream in front of us on a small polished wooden table. I could finally move but I needed answers and I stayed sitting. Who the heck are you, and what is going on? I asked, a voice cracking from the stress. Instead of being annoyed by my outburst, he just sat back into the couch and looked cool and amused. I hated him in that moment. I think you know the answer to the first question. He said with a smile that got on my nerves. Sir, I have no idea what you're talking about. Wait, sir, I never call people sir. Not unless I was busting out the sweet talk. I didn't like this man in the slightest, so what did I give him an ounce of respect? What year is it? He asked and I frowned. 2000, I think. What does that have to do with anything? How does time fly? The last time Fex encountered me, I was much different. I went by a horrible name, too. It was a strange feeling. I somehow knew what he was talking about and yet not at the same time. It was too frustrating. Liren, like glaring. That was your name before, but... How would I know that if uh, I don't know who you are? And who the heck is Fax? My head started to pound as it felt like Fax were shifting and getting shuffled on my mind. Fax is the beast you allow to possess your body. That is how you know of me. He didn't move. Only gave me another smile trying to show off his handsome features, while my body felt like it had turned into ice. And I shot up suddenly, feeling like something was behind me. And what stared back at me was that creature in the warehouse. Instead of being on all fours, it stood like a human, a sheet over its eyes but still looking down at me all the same. It was fully recovered from looking like a terrible beast. 
and yet held some kind of beauty that could make your lungs stop. I nearly fainted at the sight of it, but instead I collapsed back into the chair, head between my knees as vague memories started to flood into my brain. The man beside me I knew to be important, to be a king of some sort. The beast behind me loved that man and was completely loyal to him. I was about to die when that king asked me to give my body over to the beast. We would both live in benefit from the agreement. Wanting to keep living, I let them do what they wanted. Uh, do you need a few minutes? No, I just, I just need a straightforward answer. I said not raising my head. All right then. For who I am, I go by Silverman. I am the king of all the creatures of the dark. I was able to try and save facts from those humans and you saw how that turned out. Sadly enough, if rules are being followed, there isn't much that I can do. They knew enough of Fex's true name to capture and control them. I wanted to do more, but rules are rules. Silverman sounded a bit distant and paused for a few seconds to collect himself. Fex was about to die and he could have just eaten you and lived, but this beast is far too kind on humans. Instead, he let you take him into yourself. In a way, you were now a half-demon. I suppose that's a term for it. You shall not age and it's nearly impossible to kill you. Because half-breeds do not have true names, they do not have that weakness and cannot be killed or controlled by it. Fex, he only wanted to kill the humans who captured him. And now that it's done, he has nothing else to live for, and he gave up himself so that you may also live. I sat up looking behind me trying to see the monster that had saved my life. He was invisible, but I felt like he was still there. He would always be there. Wait, when did he kill those people? And isn't there, like, a way to split us back apart? Silverman gave my questions a wave of his hand, as if I should know the answers already. No. Once you two are together, you shall always be one. Fex has the stronger will of you two, so he can take control of your body at any point. Like I said, he is kind. He took over, killed the ones who had wronged you, and tucked you back into a comfy bed. You should have no memory of this, as if you were asleep. Although, it is possible to be aware of his actions while he is in control. But Fex forced you asleep because he guessed you would not wish to see humans dying by your own hands. I felt sick with each passing word. My hands shook and I grasped them together feeling as if they were no longer mine. I wanted to be angry at what had happened. To have my body just taken from me like that. In the back of my mind, now I knew he was there. I felt Fex's stress and worry about my reaction. Slowly, I forced all the attention out of my shoulders to accept what was being said. Yeah, it was pretty alarming to hear my body was borrowed to commit murder, but Fex really did me right by considering he could have left me to die. He only wanted this one thing. I should really just let him have it. Fex also relaxed wherever he was hiding in the back of my head. The whole thing was very, very strange and needed time to get adjusted to but it was much better than the alternative. Now, the issue is, is that you are wanted for murder. Drink your coffee. What? I sputtered out. My body acted on its own. I now knew that it was Fax taking over. He could not ignore any order from his king, so he took the mug and made me drink some. Fax did not have the forethought to cover up his crimes. After taking out the entire crew, you're on the top of a few lists. But because you are now under my care, you shall not be arrested. I arranged a new identity for you. This place is just a temporary place to rest your head and get caught up. You'll need to be on the move, but I assure you, you should not be caught for those murders. I still felt a little sick just from how much information I needed to go through. Murder wasn't right at all, but I thought about what they had put Fex through. Yeah, he was a monster. A creature that saved my life and that's more than what I could say about the people that he had killed. I was sitting and trying to take everything in when Silverman got my attention. Normally, he was the type of person that I would never get along with. Handsome and he knew it all. A killer smile that could seduce anyone he wanted. And I felt like he probably abused that power fairly often. But Fex liked him and those feelings were rubbing off on me. 
I really didn't like giving this man any of my time. You see, you could just spend your new life traveling, but how boring do you think that would become? Wouldn't you like a job, uh, something important? I knew that kind of tone that he was using. I used it most of my life. He was selling something and the beast inside my mind was dead set on listening. Don't try selling me anything, just say it. I said and Silverman let his mask drop a little. Alright. I want to use you as a hitman. Sometimes there is only so much that I can do, like with facts. I should have been able to save him sooner but my hands are tied in some situations. That would not apply to you because you are both human and not, and very hard to kill. You only need to let facts take over to do the work and you can enjoy the reward of being paid so much money that you won't know what to do with it. You'll live the easiest life by pretty much sleeping through very profitable work. And also, this won't just benefit creatures of the night. How many humans do you think Fax had to harm based on orders that he couldn't refuse? Humans and these creatures should not mix. If you take my offer, you'll be doing a lot of good in this world. I sat in thought suddenly wondering what the heck I had gotten myself into. I was wearing silk, sitting on a couch that could cost a fortune in a world so far removed from my own. Murder was horrible, even when I was doing petty crimes. I swore that I would never get to that point for money, and yet it was a very good offer. I shouldn't turn my back on humans, but still at the same time, my mind kept going back to the image of that dark creature torn and bloody. Against his will, he harmed people and fought against it. Vex killed the ones responsible so that they could never do it again. The real beasts were the ones who had caught him in the first place. What made me slowly start to nod my head was the idea of there being more Fexes out there. More creatures being used by evil for profit, and who knows what else. Alright, I said with a final nod. I felt even more sure of my choice as these seconds passed. I'll take the job. Silverman was right. Time does fly. That night was so long ago and so many things have happened since. I do have more stories to tell based on what my job brought but for now, just how I became what I am. Some memories I don't want to bring back up just yet. Right now, I simply want to think about the worst yet best night of my life. I used to work as a psychologist. My last patient made me quit. Written by Harold Keba. I can no longer cope with this horror that weighs on my mind any longer, even if I have to break a doctor's confidentiality. If this object were to fall into someone's hands, I'm not able to picture the consequences. You have to know. The world has to be warned. It has to. I had been a psychologist at a German psychiatric hospital for several years. My area of expertise are cases of phobias that are rare or even completely unheard of. During my times of work, I often dealt with the most obscure phenomena of the human mind and tried to help my patients as best as I could. I already encountered cases of spectrophobia, the fear of reflections, before the 12th of July 1978, but there had never been any complications. In most of these cases, I could deal with the phobia rather quickly, and although my patients would probably never get over their fears completely, surely their suffering was reduced through my help. And because of this, it seemed nothing special at first, when Maharu Hamano was sent to me, suffering from said strange phobia. Maharu Humano was a 19-year-old Japanese girl of fragile stature and long black hair flowing down from her shoulders, which she seemed to take a lot of care of. Her face was graceful and she had a small, petite lips that gave her a young look, but even at her first meeting, there was a strange shadow in her eyes, an underlying fear, making her face seem distant and alien. Her outward appearance was however not unusual enough to make me worry, 
and I had observed the strange darkness in her eyes and uh, several patients before her who had walked through life with deep fears. This is why Maharu's case did not appear to me as being remarkable or out of the ordinary. When I met Maharu for the first time on July 12th, she was accompanied by her mother. The good woman seemed a bit upset, but no serious worry could be read in her face. Now I let her out of my consulting room, because a conversation just between me and Maharu seemed the wisest, and the presence of her mother might have instructed the young woman's recovery. This didn't seem to worry Maharu. She appeared to be a bit ashamed and was even somewhat relieved to be able to speak with me alone about her worries. It had been her own decision to come to me as an expert, and she seemed to hope for a quick and easy recovery through weekly consultation hours. After a short greeting, she sat down in a comfortable leather armchair, which was placed next to my office chair, her arms dangling useless at her sides. Please, tell me, what exactly is worrying you? Why did you decide to come visit me and how do you expect me to help you? Well, since lately, I've gotten this, this fear of my own reflection. It is hard to describe. Every time I see my mirror image somewhere, I get this strange feeling, as if something alien is staring at me, something from beyond the mirror. I know, of course, that this is completely ungrounded. I am not superstitious at all, but nonetheless. Maharu was nervously moving her hands around. I just hope that you could help me get rid of this feeling, I guess. It was never this strong, but recently... She stopped and gulped nervously. What exactly happened? What changed? What do you want me to help you get a grip on? I tried to dig deeper. Well, I should probably tell you about the events that made me visit you. I came to Germany as a very young girl, two years old to be precise. And that is why I always felt home in this country. But my parents and grandparents who also moved here are still thinking back to Kanosawa, a small town near Tokyo. They are extremely superstitious and my grandmother often spoke of the myths and tales of Japanese culture. I loved listening to most of them, but one scared me somehow. The tale is about a girl whom her dying mother gifts a mirror and in times of hardship, she can still see her after the woman died. It is a comforting tale, but something always felt creepy about it. I often thought of the tale when I was young, but I must have forgotten it with the passing of time until my friends and I discovered a strange mirror on the side of the road last week. We were on our way back home from our last exams at school and passed a small shrubbery wherein something twinkled. One of my friends reached down into the bushes and pulled out a hand mirror. It was made from a mysterious dark material, almost coral-like, and shimmered in the light of the midday sun. The mirror wasn't very large, about as big as my hand, but the thing seemed to possess something menacing. I remembered the Japanese tale and what had crept through my soul every time I thought about it. It was not the story itself, but something different, I think. When I took the mirror and looked into it, I held it in front of my face, saw the street behind me, nothing special. But then, suddenly, I saw this thing behind me. This. She stopped and started shaking, while gazing at the ground, ashamed. And it took some time until she calmed down and was able to look up again. Her eyes were cloudy and distant. Please, tell me what you think you saw. This is important. I suspect something has been occupying your thoughts for a long time now. Maharu resumed her story reluctantly. A skinny, shadowy entity. I barely could make out its outline, but that was enough. I will never forget feeling its gaze. I did not see its eyes, but they were there, staring at me. I must have collapsed, screaming. I thought about her words. It was likely some childhood memory manifesting itself. A violent experience or some kind of shock. 
Sometimes another child jumping out from behind a corner for a scare or another similarly menial thing was enough to trigger these thoughts. I had already cured people suffering from those problems. Listen carefully. What you just told me surely must have been terrifying for you, but its origins should be quite innocuous. I think that you are probably trying to cope with some repressed memories. If people see things in the mirror that are not supposed to be there, it is likely an attempt at communication of their subconscious. In many cases, the mirror is seen as some kind of gateway. If you want to, I can offer you some other methods to try and lessen your fears besides conversing. Confrontational therapy is a possibility. Another method would be getting to the cause of your fear through hypnosis. You have to decide for yourself what suits you best. If the situation is getting worse than just being uncomfortable or if something else, like the encounter with the black mirror that you described happens, you should not wait to make an extra appointment. And while we're at it, do you still have the mirror? I would like to take a look at it. She hesitated. I guess it broke when I had my anxiety attack. At least I hope so. Thank you very much. I'll be back next week. The young woman slowly got up and I led her to the door. Her mother was still waiting outside and they hurriedly left. Nothing out of the ordinary had happened and her problems promised to not be very severe. Because I was sure that the repressed memories were easy to recover. If I had only known back then... The next consultation hour arrived rather quickly. On the 19th of July, 1978, Maharu arrived on time for her appointment. As her mother led her into the room, it became apparent that something wasn't right. The eyes of the poor girl looked tired and her skin was pale. Doctor, you have to do something. Maharu isn't herself anymore. Maharu's mother pleaded. I asked her to leave the room and shortly after... Me and Maharu were alone again. She sat down on the armchair and I noticed her hands shaking violently. What happened? I asked. It got worse, well, I guess you can see that. I can't explain it myself. Every time I get close to a mirror, my fear makes me dizzy. I am afraid to see something in there, something that watches me, that hungers for me. It's terrible. I just can't cope with it anymore. When I went to school, I couldn't even go to the bathroom because it has a giant mirror on the wall. I can't stand it anymore. Do something. She was beside herself and got louder, starting to panic. Please, calm down. You're safe here completely. You didn't see anything else. I'm sorry, I have to ask. Did you? No, she said, hesitating. No, nothing. I'm just afraid to see something. Afraid of it coming back. It's just horrifying. Would you look into a mirror right now? To see whether there is something in it. We could do it together if you'd want. This was of course a suggestion that Maharu would probably not touch upon. But I had to make sure that she was aware of that possibility. I'm with you. Nothing will happen to you. I promise. Alright, if we would do it together. Maharu slowly said. I found her taking this step so early, quite remarkable. I slowly took a hand mirror out of a drawer and placed it face down on my knees. She got up and walked to my side. Are you ready? I asked. Yes, she tearfully said but soon and got a grip on herself. I began turning the mirror gradually and we saw our mirror images but nothing else. Maharu went back to her armchair again and I noticed her shaking fading away. She began to relax. The mirror went back into its drawer and I looked at her. There was nothing, was there? No, of course not. It was stupid of me. Silly thoughts. They were in no way silly. It was just this of what you believed having seen that upset you this badly. Because of it, you started to build up fear of confrontation. It'll take some time, but your phobia will soon fade away. At least you'll be able to visit the bathroom again. Maharu started laughing. Yes, thank you very much. It certainly will be. But is it possible to try hypnotherapy next week? I want to know what exactly I got so worked up over. I have hallucinated something after all. I looked at the time. We could also do that right now. 
After all, only ten minutes of our session had passed. If you want to. Yes, of course. I want to leave it behind me. It's been enough. Who knows, the fear might come back someday. I don't have the nerves for that happening. And so I hypnotized her. It was admirable how hard she fought against her anxiety. And I had high hopes for a quick recovery of hers. She sat there, eyes closed, relaxing her limbs. I asked her to go back to the day that she and her friends had found the black mirror. It seemed to put some strain on her, but finally she had made it. I'm standing next to a road, together with my friends. We take our time walking home. Leah suddenly stops and says she had seen something. Something in the bushes twinkling. She reaches down and grabs it. It's the mirror. I, I, I'm afraid. Afraid of what, the tail? You don't have to be. You are safe, understood? Yes, yes, I'm safe, but... I've got this feeling, this feeling of discomfort. I think it's because the mirror is so weirdly black. It seems evil. I fear seeing a ghost, an evil ghost. Something monstrous from the beyond or another horrifying place. What if something is inside the mirror? I don't want to look. There is nothing inside. You are just imagining things. Ghosts don't exist. You are completely safe. Don't be afraid. Mahara's face muscles tensed and she appeared to be under a lot of stress. I, I look into the mirror. The road is behind me. Cars are passing by. Beyond the road, there's a field. There it is. The silhouette. No. She grew even more tense and her breathing got heavy. I leaned forward and tried to calm her down. Everything's alright. It can't harm you. It is just a memory. But which one? Which memory are you hiding? Please describe the silhouette. It will relax you, trust me. Everything's going to be alright. If Maharu managed to see whose silhouette she had seen, we would know what had caused her fears. And then my treatment would have reached its goal. Perhaps her father, a childhood friend, someone she knew. Who would it be? It, it is big and tall and unnatural. About three meters but skinny, incredibly skinny. And its long neck, almost as long as my arms. What is that? I know it noticed me. No! I hesitated. What was happening? Her seeing such a distorted figure was highly irregular. I almost wanted to wake her up when she suddenly relaxed. It, it turns away, despite having noticed me. It doesn't care about me. It slowly fades away shortly before her. I drop the mirror. I hurriedly woke her up. Maharu appeared to be relieved and she asked about my findings. I'm not entirely sure, but the silhouette might have been a symbol of some worry. It looks like this worry has already vanished. You said the entity you saw didn't care about you. And we can safely assume that no further extreme happenings are to take place. If something does happen, you are welcome to visit me again. But I think you should try to cope alone for the time being. Maharu left thankfully and her mother was also happy about the quick recovery. I as some doubts because I never experienced something being cured this fast. But I assumed the phobia hadn't been that severe to begin with. I did not know what the silhouette had symbolized, but it seemed to have been something unimportant for the moment. I expected to never see Maharu again at the hospital, but I would be proven wrong in a gruesome and terrible way. On the night between the 23rd and 24th of July, I got a call from the hospital. One of my patients had gone mad. The patient was Maharu. I immediately drove to the clinic, completely aghast. A colleague of mine showed me to one of the older rooms inside the basement. I found Maharu sitting on a chair, wearing a white straitjacket. After I had closed the door behind me and sat down at a table opposite of her, shivers ran down my spine. Maharu apparently did not manage to harm herself in any way, but her face looked like a mask. She crazily peered into my eyes and had a wide, surreal grin on her face. A strange, biting stench made my eyes tear up. However, I was not able to make out its source. Maharu turned up her nose and cheerfully asked about my well-being. 
What happened? What did you do? I wanted to know, ignoring her question. Maharu started laughing, joyless, coldly. Do you really want to know, doctor? Do you really want to know? Yes, why else would I be here? What happened? I, I was at home. All was well, so well. No worries, no fear of mirrors. Everything was magnificent. Magnificent. Until it was there. This hideous thing. Maharu was whispering. The silhouette, I asked. Maharu laughed again. The silhouette, no, no, the mirror. The black-handed mirror. It was lying in the sink in the bathroom, just in the sink. How did it get there? How on earth did it get there? I don't know. I have no clue, but it was there. Just there. She laughed even louder hysterically, and then suddenly stopped. She looked at me, her eyes feeling unnaturally huge, almost trying to suck me in. A friend of mine must have placed it there. Who else? It didn't break, no, but it doesn't matter. I threw it away. Away. She started humming, quietly, but kept staring into my eyes. Another shiver went down my spine when I noticed that she didn't even blink anymore. And it came back, I asked. No, of course not, you idiot. Mirrors can't walk. No, it stayed away. Everything was well. I washed my hands and wanted to leave, but then... She leaned forward even more. The lights went out. Probably some malfunction in the power grid. Surely nothing bad. No, the lights went back on and then... She stopped and pierced me with her gaze. The silence was unbearable. I had never seen someone this delusional. Suddenly, she started screaming. It was in the mirror directly in front of me. It was there, this face. This repulsing, blasphemous face. It looked at me, a grimace from beyond this world, evil, ugly, disgusting. It stared and stared so close that I could see it. So close. I ran out of the bathroom and into the living room to my parents, feeling a panic like never before. They tried to calm me down, but it didn't work. I knew it was still there. On the television screen, on the pendulum of the wall clock everywhere, it gazed into my soul. This grotesque face. I had to cut out my eyes. Didn't want to see it anymore, but my parents held me back. They held me back and I fainted. But now here, having had time to think it through... I understood. I understood, doctor. She got quiet again, but saliva started dripping out of her open mouth. What? What did you understand? I wanted to know. She gazed at me seriously, without a shred of humanity showing in her eyes or in her face. It was my own face. I look like that. Look at me, just look at me. Just my own face, how stupid of me. Her eyes opened even further, giving me a feeling of incredible uneasiness. What must have happened to make her hallucinate such horrors? It had to be a dark memory. Perhaps she was mocked with something as a child. Something happened to you long ago. We can find out what it is together. You do not have to believe such things. Doctor, are you blind? Perhaps you can still feel it. Come. Come closer, please. Come closer. With those words, Maharu stood up. She couldn't walk because her feet were chained to the chair that was screwed tightly into the ground. This was my opportunity to convince her. I began stepping in her direction slowly until a mere 30 centimeters of distance were left between us. Her eyes were two gates, trying to swallow me whole. Her mouth, just a small line in her face, gray as ash. Her hair was ruffled, but everything was normal and I could reassure her. There is nothing, Maharu, nothing. You just look tired, very tired. Touch it, feel it. This unspeakable mass, lump, go on. I have to admit that I was afraid of touching her. What if I really felt something? Something that wasn't her face? No, I couldn't act this stuporous. I began raising my hand towards her features. I stopped and hesitated, but finally got a grip on myself and touched it. It was soft and completely normal. It took a giant load off my mind and I cursed myself. What did I expect? Her stories must have been a bit too strange. Nothing wrong, all is well. You do not have to be afraid anymore. Despair crept into Maharu's eyes. 
It appeared that she had finally got to her senses. No, no, it is a grotesque face, believe me. Are you blind? She started crying. I felt sorry for her, especially because I did not know how long she had to stay here. As I started to leave, the lights flickered and died. A scared jolt ran through Maharu's body and she staggered forward, hitting me in the rush. We crashed onto the hard floor, her head smashing onto my stomach, and I let out a painful gasp. Suddenly, an unbelievably bad stench got into my nose. It came from Maharu. I could not see anything, though part of me didn't want to anyway. Closing my eyes, I tried to relax, but I noticed the lights turning back on, but my eyes stayed shut. And then I heard it. Only centimeters away from my ears, something was panting and gargling, a distorted voice. Doctor, doctor, I think you also might be able to see it now. I think you also might be able to see it now. In shock, I reached for her face. Instead of smooth skin, I felt a slimy, grisly surface. The terror almost made me lose my mind. This couldn't possibly be happening. And then I opened my eyes. Never will I forget what I saw, and never again will I be able to spend a minute in peace after this atrocity. It was a grimace lying on my stomach, having once been the face of a beautiful girl. The eyes were giant, round, and squidgy, stood out and twitched around madly. Her hair was black and disheveled, sprouting in all directions, the skin strangely blue and her nose unsettlingly normal. The jaw, however, had mainly gone back into the skull, so the creature had a huge overbite and the mouth was twisted and turned, almost like a mirror image on a pond that got distorted by waves. Her eyes were fixating me in a gruesome way and her hand clung to my ankle, Strangely, having been freed of the straitjacket, I do not remember how I got loose and ran away. Machi followed me with her eyeballs. I understood that no one will probably ever believe me, that all this sounds like me hallucinating, but it was reality. Then the following night, Maharu vanished from her guarded locked room. No one knew where she went and no one ever saw her again. There also never was another person who saw this gruesome, no, her true face. I was notified about her asking for a black hand mirror that had been found in her bathroom shortly before I came to visit her. Where the accursed object is now, I do not know. If anyone were to find it, I can only hope that due to this report, it will be destroyed immediately. Luckily, I never saw the thing myself. Who knows what horrendous things would now gaze at me from inside the mirrors. I am afraid even now of seeing this sacrilegious gruesome face from another world in a reflection one day and of it taking me. And never again did I sleep in peace. In the dark, I remember this nasty voice. Sometimes I imagine hearing it right beside me, feeling another being in my bed. Doctor, doctor, I think, I think you also might be able to see it now. I think you also might be able to see it. I was saved from a skinwalker, written by Sir Dimadome. For about a year and a half, I, a 22-year-old male, dated my ex, a 23-year-old male who was Native American, specifically Navajo. Our relationship got serious enough that we introduced each other to our parents. He and his family lived close to our college, so I would go over there quite frequently for dinner or just to visit. During spring break, his parents invited me to come with them to a log cabin that they and their extended family had rented for a weekend. I accepted, and honestly, I got kind of excited as I felt like my boyfriend and I were moving up in our relationship. I also could count the number of family vacations that I had taken growing up, on one hand so there was that. The night before we drove to the cabin, my boyfriend's parents invited me over for dinner, and after they sat me down to talk to me about the next couple of days. 
I already knew my boyfriend's grandparents were extremely in touch with Navajo traditions, and they could be harsh to certain people they saw as outsiders. They basically explained to me that they may not accept me immediately, and that they apologized if at any point they offended me. I thought about what they said the entire drive to the cabin, and it honestly only made me even more nervous the closer that we got to our destination. Meeting my boyfriend's family for the first time was stressful enough, but adding on the fact that we were the same gender and that his family may view me as an outsider made my chest unbearably tight. As we drove up to the cabin, immediately we saw that there was a group standing outside of it. My boyfriend's dad had parked the car. He and his wife jumped out to run over to the crowd to see what the issue was. The yelling was so loud you could hear it almost clearly, despite us still being in the car. I asked my boyfriend who the people were and he said they were all different family members and that a serious argument must have broken out. We got out of the car and walked around to the front of it so we could see what was going on. It looked like it was about nine people yelling at one guy. The guy had his back to us, but I remember his bizarre way of standing. It's hard to describe, but if I had to give it a comparison, it would be Mr. Cracker from The Fairly Odd Parents. The argument was so heated, it looked like nearly everyone was ready to start throwing punches. Finally, the guy with his back to us yelled something before turning and walking in our direction. I thought he was walking directly towards us, but then I realized he was on the path to walking past us. As he walked by me, I remember he looked at me really quick, and we made eye contact. His hair was long and shaggy and it came down over his face, but I could still see his eyes. They looked immensely glazed over, like the guy was beyond high. Despite nothing technically being off about him, it just felt like I had looked into the eyes of a mannequin or something. Getting over my uneasiness, I noticed the guy hadn't walked to a car, but instead had continued to walk until he walked into the woods. I turned to my boyfriend and asked where he was going, and who that was and he said that he was pretty sure it was one of his uncles, but he hadn't seen him since he was a kid. We both assumed the guy had maybe went to blow off some steam, or walk off a high, my boyfriend's parents came back and said everything was fine now and that we could take our bags out of the car to head inside. Log Cabin was honestly an understatement. The house that they had rented for the weekend was massive. It had enough rooms where everyone's personal family had their own rooms. I was beyond shocked to learn that my boyfriend's parents had gotten us our own room although it was the smallest. We settled down and then I got to go around and meet my boyfriend's family. Unexpectedly, everyone was beyond nice. I kind of felt like I'd be treated like an outsider, given how traditional my boyfriend had said his extended family was. But nearly everyone that I met greeted me with a giant hug and a warming smile. I guess the two exceptions were my boyfriend's grandparents. Both seemed very contained and had this very serious look on their faces. As I approached them to introduce myself to them, they both looked me over a couple of times before moving. Soon, they both stood and gave me a very strong-handed handshake and a pat on the shoulder. It wasn't a dream come true loving welcome but it was at least a gesture of acceptance. As the night went on, everyone in the house talked, drank, ate, and even at a period where one family member brought a guitar out and we all drunkenly sung covers of popular songs. 
I had an amazing time and it was definitely a night I wouldn't forget. I do however remember this tense feeling that was with me the entire night. Like something was around me but I couldn't see it. The night flew by and before long it was sometime after 1am and everyone was ready to go to bed. And before anyone made their way to the room for the night, my boyfriend's grandfather called everyone into the living room for a family meeting. I figured I was a guest so that included me. But before I was able to grab a seat, several male family members told me that I wasn't allowed to be here for this and that I had to go upstairs. I was kind of disheartened by this but I made my way up to my room. To be fair, I wasn't alone, as the Caucasian wife of some member of the family was also not allowed to sit in on the meeting. I went upstairs, showered, and went to my room to mess around on my phone until my boyfriend came upstairs. While I waited, I got a sudden surge of anxiety. I don't know where it came from, but my heart just started racing and it felt like I was about to cry. It lasted for only about a minute or so, but it freaked me out big time. After it ended, I sat there confused and slightly shaking. My boyfriend walked in, and seeing him settled me down. I didn't feel the need to mention it to him, as he would definitely laugh at me. He showered. We talked for a bit about the day. We did what a couple of teens do when in bed at night, and then we both went to sleep. That night, I shot up out of my sleep. I wasn't having a nightmare, I wasn't even having a dream. Suddenly, I was awake, and I vaulted out of bed. Standing there, I was confused as hell as to why my body had jolted itself awake. I thought maybe my boyfriend had kicked the crap out of me, or suddenly snatched all the covers, but when I looked down at him, he was calmly snoring with my side of the covers thrown over him from me vaulting awake. I looked at the clock. It read 4.10 a.m. I was kind of freaked out by my weird wake up, but I realized that I had to pee, so I threw on my t-shirt and shorts and left our room to make my way to the bathroom at the end of the hallway. After doing my business, I walked out of the bathroom and into the hallway. The bathroom was at the end of the hallway and it sat next to a window. I stopped at the window to take in the nighttime scenery. I looked at the moon, casting light over the family's parked cars. What stole my attention away from the cars was a figure moving among the crowd of vehicles. I couldn't tell what it was, but I just watched as it walked up and down the rows of cars. I figured it was somebody maybe looking for their car in the darkness of the night. But as my eyes adjusted, the figure clearly wasn't walking like a person. It looked like a black dog or a wolf or something four-legged. We were in a heavily wooded area so I figured it wasn't abnormal for wildlife to wander close to the house. But then the figure stood up. It didn't stand, wobbled around and then planted its front legs in the ground. It stood and continued moving through the rows of cars. I watched as the thing walked with a stiff gait around the vehicles before it just stopped to face the house. The darkness seemed to coat the creature as I couldn't make out any of its features other than its outline. And then it simply looked up at me. Not in the sky or up at the house, but at me. I couldn't see its face, but I knew it was looking at me directly. From its dark form, I saw two small white dots on its head. Just two pinpoint light dots that stared at me from outside. I don't know how long we stared at each other. But what I do know was that, before I knew it, I was walking downstairs into the front door. I just moved. No reason or want to, but my body was suddenly in motion. 
As I unlocked the front door, an iron-like hand grabbed my wrist so hard that it hurt. I looked over and saw my boyfriend's granddad standing there staring at me with a look that I'll never forget. He didn't say anything. He just relocked the door and turned me to face him. And I saw him place something against the door before he pulled out something from his pocket with a light he had lit it and circled it around my head saying something under his breath. I remember being utterly confused but just completely submissive to whatever was going on. As he finished, he used his fingers to put out whatever he lit and told me to go back upstairs. Slowly, I moved back toward the stairs, but as I turned around, I saw him pick up what I realized was a shotgun from off the doorframe. I walked upstairs and I stopped before entering my room. I looked at the window and didn't even have to walk over to it to know that that thing was still out there. I laid back in bed and after about 30 minutes of ceiling watching, I went back to sleep. It was easily the worst sleep I had ever gotten. I had what felt like 24 hours worth of nightmares that was just me running from something. I was running in slow motion and could hear something fast running after me. Right as I heard it get to me, the dream would restart. I woke up later that morning around 10 a.m. or so and saw my boyfriend was covered in sweat as he slept. He never sweated while he slept and the room was a cool 64, so I found it disturbing. I literally had to shake him for about 5 minutes before he woke up. At first, he was just dreamily staring straight ahead before he registered that I was looking over him. I can honestly tell you that my boyfriend is a part of our college's ROTC program, and he is used to waking up early. 99% of the time, he would wake up about two hours before me when he slept over. Not to mention in the rare cases that he did sleep longer than me. He would snap awake whenever I touched him. He lazily got dressed before we both went downstairs to find the entire house in a dreamlike state. Everyone moved through the house like zombies and everyone seemed half dead. Before anyone worked on breakfast, my boyfriend's grandfather called for another family meeting. I was still not allowed to listen but this one lasted much longer than the one previous. When it was over, my boyfriend and his parents told me that we were packing up and leaving. I couldn't argue, as everyone in the house simultaneously moved to the rooms to pack up their items. Within an hour, everyone had packed up and placed their belongings in their cars. As we drove away from the massive cabin, I couldn't help but feel like those same small white eyes were watching us from just out of sight. During the ride home, my boyfriend was quiet. When we had stopped to get gas, I tried to ask my boyfriend why he had left, but he just looked at me and said that it was hard to explain. Even after they had dropped me back off at my campus apartment, I wondered if the reason the trip had been cancelled was because of the figure that I had seen that night, as well as the dreamlike state everyone had woken up in. Up until we broke up, I would ask my ex why the trip had been cancelled, and he never really gave me a direct answer. He would just say that I wouldn't understand, or that it was a family dispute. It wasn't until after we broke up that I saw a documentary on skinwalkers. It made me shudder to think what would have happened if I had opened that door and walked outside. A search for Bigfoot uncovered something much worse, written by New Age Solution. I work for my hometown's local paper as a reporter. Being a small Appalachian community, any newsworthy happenings in those parts occurred sparingly. So when an opportunity arose to cover a paranormal group investigating a nearby national forest, 
I thought it would make a compelling story. Known as SCAR, Supernatural Cryptid Anomaly Researchers, they were filming a docu-series after having modest success with a previous documentary. SCAR gained some notoriety when they released strange unknown recordings that they captured on an expedition in western Pennsylvania that even got attention from some mainstream news outlets. They conducted expeditions from the spring to fall, primarily visiting locations throughout the Northeast United States, where they looked into uh, supported stories of cryptids, hauntings, and other unexplained phenomena. Scar was here looking into Bigfoot reports, which I learned came out of this area fairly often. I never really dwelled on whether such a creature could exist, but their arguments and hypotheses admittedly kept me open to the possibility. Our base camp was a primitive site in a remote section of the forest that had no cell phone reception, and was miles from the nearest house or paved road. The team was quite impressed with my prowess and know-how, probably figuring a young woman like myself would be out of their element in the wilderness. In actuality, I have always been an outdoor enthusiast and I will participate in anything involving camping and hiking. The team consisted of five individuals who dubbed themselves as ordinary people exploring the unknown and unexplained. Scar was founded by Brayden, the director, Shane, their tech and equipment guru, and Corey, who performed most of Scar's PR and communicative duties, Mitchell, who wrote the show and organized expeditions, and Devin, their main camera operator, were younger than the three founders and they were closer to my age. What I found interesting was how these individuals couldn't be any more different from each other, appearing to have nothing in common beside a mutual infatuation for the unknown. Their little team was certainly a testament to how people can still have common interests despite coming from all walks of life. We didn't do much that first day, which was mostly spent setting up camp, filming the team members answering questions and reciting monologues. That night was relatively uneventful. After setting up shop, we cooked dinner and finalized our itinerary for the next two days. Mitch, Devin, Shane, and myself briefly ventured out to get a feel for the area and to do a few of what we were called vocalizations and wood knocks, methods they believe are how Bigfoots communicate. They didn't get any responses and we called it a night after about an hour. I interviewed each team member on the second day and was also questioned by Brayden for their docuseries. We then scouted these spots where our night ops investigation would take place, and walked a stretch of riverbank looking for prints. I was impressed at how much research and preparation went into these outings, and while the degree of belief in Bigfoot varied among each individual, their professionalism and organization were exemplary. I actually became really excited about the night investigation, we had split into two groups, a mobile team, Mitch, Devin, and myself, and a static team, Shane, Corey, and Brayden. We would hike to a swampy marsh while the static team parked alongside a road, one to two miles away, and periodically emitted a call blast, playing amplified animal and alleged Bigfoot calls over a speaker. We would post up at the swamp for a few hours, before bushwhacking back to the road and reuniting with the static team. We were dropped off at 11 p.m. and took roughly 90 minutes to reach the swamp, where we hunkered down for an hour before making any knocks or vocalizations. Armed with red headlamps, digital recorders, a camcorder, and thermal imaging, Mitch and Devin thoroughly scanned our surroundings, looking for any signs of movement where they weren't filming. Intrigued by their use of red light, Mitch, who I might add was the most attractive among the five of them, explained to many animals that couldn't perceive red light, and it was easier to see in the dark with than white. The teams communicated with radios that, on Mitch's insistence, we only had one of, which got pretty spotty at times due to the distance between our groups. We stayed at the swamp until 2.30 in the morning, during which Mitch and Devin did a few vocalizations and wood knocks. Remarkably, they had some potential activity, a faint groaning howl after Mitch did a call, two potential knocks in response to one of Devin's, 
and a deep, woeful wail about 20 minutes after a call blast that both teams had heard. Ironically, I wound up being more animate about the responses we received than Mitch and Devin. While encouraged by the activity, they reminded me there were a million other things those noises could be, and probably were before a Bigfoot. Using power lines crossing the swamp as a visual reference, since they ran parallel in the direction that we were going, we bushwhacked over a mile into the woods before reaching a brook that Mitch said marked our halfway point out to the road. We stayed at this spot for another hour, doing more calls and knocks, including my first Bigfoot call, but had no additional activity. It wouldn't be uncommon for them to figure out that they're not communicating with one of their own, Mitch told me after doing a set of wood knocks. So, unless they move in for a closer look, they'll pretty much go dark for the rest of the night. We stayed at the brook until 4.30 a.m., when the lack of additional activity prompted Mitch and Devin to call it a night. Everyone was tired, and the possible activity from earlier ultimately made these night ops a success. We found a crossable section of the brook that Devin and I traversed without incident. Mitch, however, took a misstep and sank up to his thighs in mud. My foot's caught under like a root or something, Mitch said in a flustered tone, unable to shake himself free. Yeah, I'm stuck. I'm gonna need like a rope or something. By Mitch's estimates, we were 20 to 30 minutes away from the road. Despite having reservations about leaving him alone, he insisted Devin and I meet the others. After informing the static team of our dilemma, Devin and I headed out, leaving Mitch with the radio. I give him a lot of credit for staying there by himself, stuck like that, in the middle of the night and the middle of the woods. I said to Devin, who nodded in agreement, He'll be fine. This isn't the worst predicament I've seen him in. He replied with a slight smirk forming across his face. I noticed how you were looking at him, though. What do you mean? I asked, blushing while trying to play dumb, despite knowing exactly what Devin meant. Come on, don't BS, BSer, Devin said teasingly. I laughed bashfully, thankful that we were having this discussion in the middle of a remote forest, where nobody could eavesdrop. Maybe I should have gone back by myself so you guys could have gotten to know each other a little more. Oh, shut up, I uttered giddily, playfully pushing Devin as we walked. I'm serious, he said in between chuckles. There's no way he'd let one of us walk this alone. But the good news for you is that I think he's also interested. Devin eventually changed the subject and told me a few stories about some of the shenanigans he and Mitch got into, while also noting the irony of Mitch forcing them to take one radio. Shane wants each team to have at least two radios, specifically in case something like this happens, Devin said chuckling. Mitch doesn't like bringing two because they both go off at once when someone says something. He thinks noises like that will deter anything nearby, especially since he's the kind of person who always has to be right. The others won't let him live this one down. And we walked for another 15 minutes when something caught Devin's eye. Is that a person? He whispered, coming to an abrupt stop. About ten yards in front of us was a slender human shape standing with their torso backwardly bent across a narrow tree stump. The moonlight only revealed its vague outline, which didn't react to our presence. Despite feeling uneasy, we warily approached the motionless figure, and gasped in fright as its details became clearer. It was indeed a person, a man to be precise. He was held in this awkwardly bent posture by a tree stump's narrow pointed tip, which was impaled through his chest. It was hard to infer much about the man based in his clothing. Light beige, cargo pants, boots, and a forest green button down, most of which were deeply bloodstained. The top half of his head was missing, and the man's mouth hung agape, being permanently frozen at mid scream. We have to call someone, Devin said staring nervously at his cell phone, which had no service. Whatever killed this guy did it recently, like tonight recently, and it's definitely still nearby. What about Mitch? I asked, which only made Devin, who was visibly shaken by the grisly sight, even more uneasy. 
He can't stay out here alone, Devin said, and I'm going to take his eyes off the body. We should get back to him, get back to the brook and take it from there. And we reversed course and hurried back to Mitch, speculating about what living in these woods could have killed that man along the way. I think he may have been with the Forest Service or one of those branches, Devin remarked. I saw a rifle in the ground next to his pack, which had some kind of logo on it. I couldn't see what it was though, but it looked pretty official. Why didn't you take it with us? I asked about the rifle coming to a halt. It's a crime scene, Devin quickly replied. We would probably get in more trouble if we touched anything. I didn't want to say anything, but... But what? I asked, staring sharply at Devin, who was clearly unnerved over what he was about to say. Devin sighed. Pretty sure that I saw a footprint or two. Devin revealed before he resumed walking. Human footprints. Barefoot human footprints. So I don't think an animal killed that guy. Devin, who was more of a skeptic, immediately dismissed any possibility of the culprit being a Bigfoot, assuring me the prints he saw were actually human. We agreed not to tell Mitch, who we heard talking on the radio as we neared the brook, or at least wait until he was freed. When we got closer, however, it became evident that the radio chatter we heard was between Brayden and Corey. Mitch was nowhere to be seen upon returning to the spot. While Devin called for Mitch, I found the radio lying at the base of the tree next to the muddy bank. Did Mitch throw the radio? I thought while staring at the device. I was about to film the static team on our current situation when Devin screamed my name and stumbled back from the brook, losing his footing and feverishly gesturing with his trembling finger as he stumbled. Following the direction that he pointed, I dropped the radio and cupped my hands over my mouth. Sticking out from the mud were the bloody stumps of Mitch's severed legs. Shining my flashlight on an overhanging tree limb protruding over where Mitch once stood revealed more gruesome details. Blood smeared on parts of the limb was still dripping, while bits of flesh and skin were visible within its appendages. Whatever did this to Mitch must have attacked him from directly above, I thought before spotting something circular and white glistening in one of these smaller branches. Initially noting whatever it was had a red tadpole-like tail, I began retching upon realizing that it was a human eye. After my puking episode, I took a few recollected breaths before grabbing the radio, but was bear-hugged by a pair of arms that violently dragged me from the brook. We gotta go now, Devin exclaimed as he hauled me away until I ran on my own two feet. I heard something big rustle in the nearby brush that further motivated me to follow Devin's lead. Sobbing in between quick, frantic breaths, I kept my eyes fixed on the back of Devin's head while running through the woods, feeling certain that I heard thumbing footsteps coming from behind us that were effortlessly keeping pace. We didn't stop running, even when the road came in sight. After getting this far unscathed, however, I lost my footing and fell hard when we had reached the dirt road. Devin quickly came to my aid, but I shoot him away to have some space while regaining my composure. Oh, we gotta find the others, Devin said in between breaths, standing hunched over alongside me, grasping his knees. Oh, we gotta get going, Aria. We're sitting ducks out here. It felt like my legs physically gave out, so attempting to stand at that time would be an adverse task. Devin sensed this and pulled out his thermal monocular to scan our surroundings. A few seconds into his 360 degree survey, he quickly lowered the camera and emphatically pointed at a pair of oncoming headlights. That's them. I think that's them. Devin said eagerly with some giddiness in his voice. Seeing the headlights was rejuvenating and gave peace of mind, knowing that we wouldn't be out here much longer. I got into my wobbly feet and walked up alongside Devin, who like myself was matted in a sweating dirt. Devin stepped back when the car drew nearer, which was when I noticed the worried look on his face. That's not Brayden's truck, he said, clearly unsure whether we should stay or run. After stopping about 10 feet from us, a man and woman emerged from the vehicle. The pair looked clean and very approachable 
their eyes showing genuine concern as they took tentative steps towards where we stood. Do you guys need help? The man asked, his sincere, sympathetic tone causing me to yet again break down in tears, while Devin began explaining our situation. My name's Gabby, the woman who walked up to me said, while Devin spoke to the man. That's my future brother-in-law, Tobias. Are you hurt? You guys don't look okay. We, uh, our friend is dead, was killed, in the woods, I stammered, while jitterily pointing in the direction from which we came. We have to get someone, have to call for help. While offering me some water, I noticed the gold bracelet Gabby wore that had a pink heart-shaped charm. Graciously taking the bottle, I took a few gulps and finished catching my breath before being able to speak coherently. That's a nice bracelet. I heard myself blurt out as I was hit with a sense of calm. I'm Arya. Looking at her rest, Gabby smiled and politely chuckled. Well, that's actually why we're here. Gabby said before ushering me towards the car. We're looking for my sister, Claire. I nodded at Gabby as we rejoined Devitt and Tobias by their SUV. We're looking for Bigfoot. I muttered softly. They'll help us find the others, Devin said, motioning for us to get into Tobias' vehicle. We climbed in the back, relieved our nightmare ended before it could start, but were still shaken by what we saw. We're looking for his fiance, Claire, who vanished here a few days ago. Devin told me as we sat in the car, while Tobias and Gabby went to get some blankets from the truck. Gabby's sister, I added, to which Devin nodded. They're going to get us to help quicker, he said softly. I was distracted by another set of headlights approaching from behind the SUV. Thinking that it must have been the static team, I was surprised when a black two-door jeep pulled up alongside Tobias and Gabby. They briefly spoke with the driver before he rolled forward and stopped in front of the SUV. Who was that? I whispered to Devin, while we watched Tobias and Gabby continue speaking to the driver. Do you think they've got something to do with what happened to Match? Devin motioned for me to stay quiet when Tobias and Gabby started to head back to the car. You're in luck, Tobias said as he and Gabby got into their seats. That was the game warden. We told him what's going on and he's taking us back to the station. What about the others? I asked with visible concern. They're still out there with whatever had killed Match. He wants us to get to the station first and then I'll find your friends. Gabby said while handing me a blanket. It's only a few miles down the road. Tobias remotely closed the trunk before he started following the jeep. Nobody said anything for the first few minutes, which I spent scanning the road for any signs of the static team. So you're looking for Bigfoot? Gabby asked, breaking the timid silence. Devin and I nodded. Devin and the others are investigators. I'm covering them for the paper that I write for her, I replied, tightly hugging the blanket. Where'd you get that bracelet? Well, I made it actually, Gabby said, looking down at the heart-shaped trinket and smiling. I made one each for myself, my sister, and her daughter, and my niece, the one you're looking for. Gabby nodded. Her daughter went missing a few years ago, Gabby continued, lightly tapping her bracelet's heart-shaped charm with her finger and she's been searching for her ever since. I made the bracelets right before I last saw my niece. I still remember putting it on her little wrist. My eyes locked into the rearview mirror when I saw a brief flash of something in light red. About a week ago, Claire's search brought her here, Gabby continued. She arrived earlier this weekend and nobody's heard from her since. And that's why you guys are here, Devin asked. You're looking for your sister and niece. Gabby's smile vanished and was replaced by an expression of a shock and panic. She screamed, but it was drowned out by an even louder, deeper, guttural shriek as the reddish-white figure sprung from the trunk. Plopping in the back seat between Devin and I, its slender arms violently thrashed about, trying to grab one of us with its massive, oversized hands. The few glimpses I caught of our attacker revealed it was a man with bare reddish-beige skin covered by light ashy gray blotchy patches. 
I noted its roundish jaw, massive forehead, green eyes, scrunched nose, and a few small clumps of scraggly gray hair growing from his balding head. The entire car erupted into screams as the deranged maniac went straight for Gabby and Tobias. Failing to control violently swerving the SUV, Tobias couldn't simultaneously focus ahead of him and fend off our attacker. Unaware of a sharp turn that nobody spotted until the jeep ahead of us had rounded it, he was engaged with the monstrous assailant savagely clawing at him when his car drove off the road down an embankment. The SUV quickly picked up speed before crashing into a small tree, a sequence that unfolded in seconds. I was dazed but managed to open my door and plop onto the ground. Crawling from the car, I slowly got on my back, only to watch the tree Tobias's SUV had crashed into snap completely. The car resumed sliding downhill, whose brake lights signified its location while careening down the slope, before getting swallowed by the darkness. All I could do was gasp and helplessly extend my hand when this happened before laying back down. Unable to cope with my distorting blurry vision, pounding headache and excruciating body aches. Minutes later, a few gunshots rang out, after which someone made their way down the incline to my location. The first thing I saw were a pair of muddy boots and light beige cargo pants. The darkness prevented me from making out any of the person's facial features, but I saw that he also wore a forest green button down, his clothes reminiscent to those worn by the corpse Devin and I had found. I heard the man mutter, Oh shit, along with something along the lines of, this will just make things harder. I faded in and out of consciousness, later learning that I suffered a nasty concussion. All I remember was being dragged back onto the road, thrown in a trunk. Upon finally coming back through, I lay on my side, still suffering from a pulsating head and body ache. I tried moving but realized that my hands and feet were tightly bound. Despite feeling so groggy, the panic that set in while comprehending my current situation manifested as a knotty queasiness. In examining my surroundings, I was laying on a dirt floor in an L-shaped enclosure with concrete walls. Looking directly above me, my confines didn't have a ceiling, and I quickly noticed a partial set of stairs that cut about seven or eight feet from the ground. I was trapped. You're awake. I heard a female voice say that, which instantly revitalized my alertness. A silhouette emerged from around the corner. It squirmed and crawled like a limbless life form, which was when I realized that it was another person, whose limbs were also tied. She looked very thin and frail, her pale skin, clothes, and scraggly dark red hair covered in dirt and grime. She had a small face with animate blue eyes, whose intent, hopeful stare locked with mine. You can free us, the woman said who maneuvered toward a pipe sticking from the ground. If I push this pipe down, the other end will jut out of the ground right by you. Its edge is sharp enough to cut through your rope. Not waiting for my response, she pushed on the extruding pipe which slowly sank into the ground. Just as she has said, the pipe's serrated opposite end rose from the ground right where I lay. I slowly nudged towards the pipe and feverishly rubbed the twine around my hands against its jagged edge. It took a few minutes to cut through the rope and untie my feet all while ignoring the debilitating pains and sores plaguing my body. I was a little unsteady standing, but I managed to untie the woman. While getting up, something around her wrist got stuck in the pipe. She tried shaking free but had to manually unsnag herself, which was when I noticed a bracelet she wore had gotten caught. It was gold with a familiar looking pink heart shaped charm dangling from its chain. It took a second, but upon remembering where I saw that same exact bracelet before, the realization hit me like a knockout punch. Claire? I heard myself ask the woman. The woman stared at me blankly. You know my name? She asked suspiciously, posturing herself like she was ready to attack or defend at a moment's notice. I was with your sister Gabby earlier, I said, stepping back and putting up my hands to indicate that I meant no harm. Her and Tobias, your fiancé. They picked me and my friend up. They're here looking for you, Claire. Do you know where we are? Why we're here? Gabby and Tobias are here, 
Claire asked with surprising concern as she eased her uptight stance. I was about to reply, but Claire continued speaking. Let's worry about getting out of here first, she quickly said, wiping away muddy tears from her eyes before turning towards the out-of-reach staircase. Do you think you can give me a boost? I'll be able to get you up afterwards. It took a few tries, but I gave Claire a boost using my intertwined hands for her to climb under the stairs. It took a little longer to pull me up since I still lacked adequate upper body strength and required Claire's assistance. Especially for someone who had clearly been trapped in that hole much longer, I truly admired Claire's persistence and tenacity, casting doubt on my ability to possess such strength if I was in her position. After emerging from our confines, I saw we were being held in the basement level of an old abandoned dilapidated foundation in an advanced state of ruin. The sky was a luminous shade of dark blue, indicating nighttime was transitioning to dusk. Unsure what to do next, I patted myself down and cursed when I realized my phone or any other communicative devices I had were in my possession. I'm pretty sure he took my friend this way, Claire said, nodding towards a trail that I wouldn't have noticed if she didn't bring it to my attention. When he dropped you off, I heard him drag someone else away. It sounded like a man. I'm assuming he was with you. I just want to know what's going on. We were attacked by something before we wrecked out. I don't know who this person is that put us here. I'm just so confused. I babbled to Claire, trying to repress a sob. Confused and scared. Really scared. Claire slowly shook her head in agreement. Well, I'm sure by now you've figured out that they aren't game wardens, Claire replied. That's what worries me about my sister and fiancé being out here. They? I asked curiously. There's two of them, Claire said. The one you probably saw, his name's Kurt. I don't know who the other one is, but they're working together. I recalled seeing the body with Devin when we were walking back from the brook. Pretty sure the other one's dead, I said flatly. Devin, the guy I was with when your sister and fiancé found us. We found a body earlier. Something had tore it to pieces, but I remember he wore the same thing as Kurt. You said his name was. Claire nodded. I guess he got what was coming to him, she said coldly. Trying to remain stealthy, we quietly proceeded down the trail, keeping an eye out for any movement. Despite our wariness, we lightly conversed, during which Claire brought up her missing daughter. Seven years ago, Claire said that she was in a bad place, where life was all about catering to her hopeless addictions. Having a child didn't quell their dependency and it drove her to sell her own baby for what she described as a life-altering amount of cash. After getting back on our feet, Claire spent these last few years trying to find her daughter. After finding the man that she had sold her daughter to, who turned out to be Kurt, Claire spent time tracking him and learned his ways for an organization called Wild Jigan. Now all she knew about them is that they run some kind of underground operation, and one of their compounds is located in this national forest. Clara said that she had infiltrated the property a few days ago, but got caught before being able to uncover anything more about Wild again. She clearly had been held in that abandoned foundation for quite a while, and didn't appear to fabricate anything that she had just disclosed. So her story, although outlandish, was believable. Stop, Clara said sharply, holding out her arm to keep me from walking further. Tensing sharply, I froze. Just ahead of us was a small clearing, where we heard something squirming on the ground, whose movements coincided with an unrhythmic metallic rattling. Upon creeping closer, it was revealed to be a person chained to a tree. My blood froze. It was Devin. Before I could take another step, Claire grabbed me and knelt us down behind some cover, giving a shushing gesture with her finger. There's a stand in one of those trees, she whispered, nodding towards the clearing. I can't tell if anyone's in it. After verifying the stand was unoccupied, Claire gave the okay before we rushed over to Devin. He was bleeding from his head and had a black eye along with some scrapes and bruises, but was pretty coherent. Devin's hands were bound and he had a metal collar around his neck, whose chain was embedded in the tree that he lay against, essentially leashing him to the spot. 
He perked right up when we had appeared, quickly replacing the look of terror in his face with relief. Me left about a half hour ago, Devin said, who despite being clearly elated by our arrival was nowhere near at ease. He said that he's using me as bait. Devin said Tobias and Gabby managed to get away, and the man, we presumed to be Kurt who chained him up, left the stand to track the pair. I think he's going after what was in Tobias's car. Devin replied when asked what he thought the man was trying to hunt. Claire, who brought Devin up to speed on everything she had told me, reiterated that she didn't get far enough into the wild chicken compound to know any more than we did about their doings. Even after describing everything I remembered about what had attacked us, Claire was clearly unsettled by the implications, but just as clueless on what we could have encountered. And noticing the collar's clamp looked relatively flimsy, we unhatched a plan to free Devin. Dragging a large, flat rock over, we had Devin position the collar's backside on its smooth surface and intended on smashing it with another stone. Despite how dangerously close we were to inadvertently injuring Devin, it took four good bashes before the collar finally broke. And knowing anything nearby probably hurt our racket, we quickly resumed moving down the trail, feeling a little more settled when Devin mentioned Kurt headed in another direction. Devin said whatever caused Tobias to crash slipped out of the SUV when it finally came to a rest, and it was even shot at by Kurt. He secured Devin and I first, thinking Gabby and Tobias were both dead, and he set them aside. According to Devin, Kurt said he needed live bait since they were attracted to movement. Tobias and Gabby regained consciousness about an hour after Devin got chained up, and snuck away before Kurt realized that they had fled. You were out of it, Devin said about me after the wreck. You kept slipping in and out of consciousness, babbling and murmuring. He had no idea what was going on. We continued moving for another couple of minutes, doing our best to stay out of plain sight and keep an eye out for Kurt or other potential threats. It was well over 100 yards away, but through the trees, we made out a road. Despite feeling hopeful about being a huge step closer to safety, I refused to let my guard down until we had reached a civilization. I'm pretty sure it's the same road Braden, Corey, and Shane said they would be on. Devin said anxiously as he picked up his walking speed. Putting some distance between us as Devin eagerly tried reaching the road, I was about to say that he should slow down, when he released a high-pitched shriek and dropped to the ground. To my horror, a small child-sized person with fleshy, light beige skin was wrapped around Devin's leg. The child had long, grimy, unkempt hair that ran down to her knees and released a series of gargly, grumpy growls while viciously digging her teeth and fingernails into Devin's calf. Before Clara and I could intervene, a larger mass had emerged from the brush. What I could only describe as a hulking, deformed human stepped between us and Devin. Its skin had a similar colored tone as the little girl attacking Devin, but was severely misshapen. Its left shoulder and arm were abnormally broad and muscular, the being's right arm was missing and its chest looked firm, but you could see the ribcage's outline. The large man's torso narrowed towards his hips, connecting to a pair of legs with thighs thick as tree trunks. It was covered in brown and gray blotchy patches that I couldn't tell were mud or actual skin. Its most disturbing feature was a light pink soccer ball sized growth, protruding from its neck that seemed to have absorbed part of its face's left side. Appearing uninterested, the alpha-looking male snarled at us with its awkwardly bent nose and twisted, toothy mouth before facing Devin. The child-sized female, whose face and hands were coated in blood, excitedly pranced around Devin while he hollered in hysterical agony on the ground. Both his calves had massive chunks of flesh missing, with some areas even exposing parts of his tibias and fibulas. The alpha male swiftly broke off a thick tree limb and began ruthlessly bludgeoning Devin, while the little girl wildly cheered out on her gargantuan counterpart. Let's go! Claire whispered and pulled me from the graphic scene unfolding. The last thing I saw before looking away was the alpha male pressing its unnaturally oversized hand against Devin's head, whose skull began to cave under the mounting pressure. We took off in another direction, which the two beings didn't seem to notice or care about. 
remaining preoccupied with Devin's lifeless body. Beelining towards a forest's edge, Claire raced ahead of me and was first to reach the road. I watched Claire sprint out of the woods, but at that same time, the road bend she burst out to was illuminated by a yellowish-white glow. No sooner than realizing there were headlights, whose luminosity seemed to swallow up Claire, I heard two loud thuds mixed with the screechy grinding of a vehicle abruptly breaking. Screaming Claire's name as I had emerged, my fears were confirmed that she had been hit by the oncoming vehicle. I quickly dropped to my knees alongside her, who was out cold, and brandished a fresh set of cuts and bruises from the impact. Frantically shaking and tapping her face, I checked Claire's pulse, exhaling in relief when I felt its slow redundant beats in her neck. Where did you guys come from? A familiar voice blurted from my backside, during which Gabby appeared next to me, falling to her knees and scrambling over Claire's unconscious body. While she whimpered and desperately pleaded for her sister to be okay, a heavy hand fell on my shoulder. I quickly turned to face who was behind me and was overcome with relief upon seeing that it was Brayden. He was clearly distraught over hitting Claire and repeatedly asking if we were okay, while the others spilled out from his truck. I saw Corey and Shane, but was surprised when Gabby and Tobias also exited the vehicle. They both rushed over to Claire, while I spoke with Brayden and the other SCAR team members. Brayden said that they had found Tobias and Gabby alongside the road, who filled them in on everything that had happened, and mentioned how we ran into each other. I was suspicious about the other SCAR members running into Tobias and Claire at first, but ultimately figured it wasn't that great of a coincidence since we were probably the only ones running around out here at this time of night. Fortunately, Claire came back through and was having an emotional reunion with her sister and fiancé that I had to cut short after reminding them of our dire situation. The other SCAR members didn't comprehend the magnitude of what was happening until I revealed that Mitch and Devin were both dead. Shane was really rattled by the news who neared a point of hysteria before Shane and Braden got him in the truck. After we had loaded up Claire, I made sure the trunk was empty before Brayden began driving. Claire was still dazed from the impact and fell in and out of consciousness throughout the drive. Gabby tried keeping her awake and alert, fearing she might have suffered some sort of head trauma and didn't want her sister dozing off if that were the case. We initially intended on heading back to civilization for help. However, when the ranger station came within view, we decided to check it out since we were at least an hour from the nearest town. Brayden pulled into these stations a dirt lot as we briefly inspected our surroundings before exiting. A few lights were on inside the two-story cabin, and Gabby pointed out someone who appeared to be sitting at the main room's front desk. Gabby, Brayden, and myself entered the cabin, while Tobias, Shane, and Corey stayed with Claire. Upon entering the ranger station, we were aghast at the bloody mess that greeted us which centered around a body slouched over in an office chair. The office was in complete disarray, showing clear signs of a violent struggle. The ranger's body was missing its arms, entire upper right side of his face and jaw. Four large gashes ran in different directions across his chest and abdomen, from which blood and bodily entrails that spilled from the gaping wounds formed a tight circle around the chair containing the body. Not a pretty sight, is it? A man said as he entered the office from a darkened room. He was already like that when I got here. I reckon they did this to him earlier in the night. But I just did a sweep of the station and I assured you, it's just us here. This man had on the same uniform as the dead ranger. A forest green button down in beige khakis that was covered in red and brown stains. He also wore dark boots and a black cowboy hat covering his short black hair. He had pale skin, a lean-toned figure, and was well over six feet tall. The man had a narrow face, a short cleft chin, dark eyes, and a thin goatee. What kept us frozen in place was the revolver openly displayed in his holster, and bolt-action rifle pointed in our direction. It's you, I said sternly, immediately recognizing him as the man who had abducted me from the car rack. Kurt, he smirked. Yeah, I'm still ticked off you guys ruined my bait station, Kurt said, gesturing outside with his head. 
I had a good setup there. You're sick. Why are you doing this to us? Gabby asked in a shaky voice, clearly terrified by Kurt's reappearance. We just want to leave. I'm here cleaning up your sister's mess, Kurt replied sneeringly. During our tense exchange, Braden drifted towards a nearby CB radio. He was two or three steps away, when Kurt quickly turned towards the table that it was on and fired a round from his rifle that shattered the radio into pieces. Everyone either screamed or violently winced at Kurt's shot, which filled my ears with an intense ringing. Kurt began yelling and shaking his rifle. Although the ringing in my ears prevented me from hearing what he said, I slowly stepped back, sensing from his body language that he wasn't in a joking mood. When the ringing finally subsided, the first thing I heard was a guttural, thunderous scream coming from outside. It'd be smart to get your friends inside before they close in. Kurt sent an acknowledgement to the shriek that undoubtedly came from one of those hideous creatures. Brayden opened the door to go outside, but Shane and Corey were already a few steps from the cabin entrance. Kurt came out with us, keeping his rifle trained on the impenetrable darkness. Gabby told Shane and Corey to get Claire from the car and bring her inside, during which Kurt fired another round. I and a few others saw what he was shooting at, the small child-sized creature darting in between two trees, which accelerated our urgency to move Claire. She was semi-conscious when we had reached the car, and needed our help getting on her feet. Shane and Corey pulled Claire out and guided her, while Brayden and Tobias stayed close behind and hurried them into the cabin. While returning inside, Claire tripped on a step and almost fell, but Corey managed to grab her in time. Claire was wincing in pain when we got her inside. The stumble she took appeared to have injured her ankle. I stood a few feet from the doorway and I watched as Brayden, who was the last to enter, was about to step inside. When a pair of feet landed on his shoulders, appearing to have jumped down from directly above the entrance, a hand from the body these feet were attached to sank its claw-like nails into Brayden's eyes, who released a horrifying scream and stumbled backwards before falling. Brayden's attacker jumped to the ground and stood over him, and sank its claws into either side of his lower abdomen in a single motion, essentially latching onto Brayden's broad figure. While it maneuvered to stand above Brayden's backside, I caught my first glance of the being, an adult-looking female, she had a mop of frizzy black hair that ran the length of her back, containing clumps of dirt twigs and leaves. Her lips looked like they were torn off, exposing her reddish-gray teeth and gums, while her large, manic black eyes were surrounded by thick, dark red circles. Her saggy, wrinkled skin had a brownish-orange tint, and was also littered with gray and brown blotchy patches that were indistinguishable between actual skin or grime. The feral-looking being started dragging Brayden from the door, but not before Kurt grabbed onto his arm. He tried heaving Brayden back into the doorway, taking the female by surprise, whose one hand slipped out of Brayden's side. I caught a brief glimpse of the fiend's claws, more so resembling thick fingernails about three to four inches long, with pointed at triangular tips, before she thrust them into another spot right above Brayden's hip. He continued wailing in torment as Shane rushed over to grab Brayden's other arm, during which the female firmly planted its feet on the ground and started dragging Brayden from the door. The pitch of Brayden's screams heightened and were accompanied by a sharp ripping sound, which was the bean's embedded clawed fingernails slicing through his sides, creating deep wounds that slowly began stretching his abdomen. I stared, horrified at Brayden, whose beet red face was matted with perspiration and expressed the blatant unbearable agony he was undergoing. It prompted me to run over and help, when a whitish pale flash slammed into the doorway. I could tell just by looking at its menacing green eyes that this was the same being that had attacked us in Tobias' car, which looked like a mature male, but significantly younger and physically inferior to the mammoth alpha figure Claire and I had encountered. While trying to force itself through the doorway, the fiend didn't acknowledge me while opening its gaping mouth filled with misshapen teeth and furiously clamped down on Kurt's arm. As Kurt hollered in pain, 
Tobias and Corey rammed their shoulders against the door, trying to prevent the male being from getting inside the cabin. I was completely speechless, unable to budge while comprehending everything going on. Kurt and Brayden simultaneous screams, the ongoing tug of war over Brayden between us and those monstrous savages, and the same creature that had attacked us earlier on the verge of bursting into the ranger station. I was on the verge of succumbing to panic when I noticed Kurt's rifle leaning against the wall unattended, along with his holster being completely exposed. Rushing over, I instinctively grabbed Kurt's revolver and cocked the pistol, while Kurt screamed for me to shoot the fiend whose jaws were still clenched around his arm. I shakily held out the revolver and squeezed the trigger, firing around that at the very least and grazed the creature's head, which was enough for it to release Kurt's arm and retreat. Corey and Tobias pushed more of the door shut, but wedged Brayden, who was now convulsing and spurting blood from his mouth in the entranceway. Shane grabbed at Brayden's arm, urging him to hang on, which was when I noticed a growing bulge protruding from his stomach. He released a gargled scream as the bulge grew bigger, until four distinct points formed under his shirt and cut through the fabric, revealing it to be the female's clawed hand. The vile being literally sank its hand into Brayden's back and pushed it completely through his body. Shane was so petrified that he lost grip on Brayden's arm, who was swiftly dragged outside in what felt like an instant. Tobias and Corey slammed the door shut, while Kurt reeled on the floor. Shane, who I stood behind, remained frozen in terror, staring at the spot where Brayden once lay, his lip quivering and widened eyes containing an expression of astonishment and fright. And Kurt was completely focused on his arm, which had two bite-sized chunks of flesh missing, and bled profusely. I was closer to the rifle now, which I brought to the other's attention before taking two quick steps and snatching the firearm with one hand, while pointing at the revolver at Kurt. Tobias rushed over, who quickly retrieved the rifle and trained it on Kurt. Still grimacing when he faced us, Kurt seemed to disregard the two guns aimed at him remaining more concerned about his mangled limb. Shane wedged a chair beneath the doorknob and noted the first floor windows had bare shutters over them, clarifying that the ranger station was more or less secure for the time being. Corey checked the rest of the cabin while Gabby tended to Claire, who she had laid out on a couch in the adjacent room. Despite Brayden's ongoing muffled screams and sounds of him getting torn apart, we didn't take our eyes off of Kurt. All right, Kurt gasped, gritting his teeth while undoing the button down he wore and began wrapping it around his arm. I guess I got a bit of explaining to do. Brayden screams and any sounds of movement outside faded after a few more minutes. Corey threw a sheet over the dead ranger and wheeled his body into a back room. Tobias and I kept the guns that trained on Kurt, while Shane made sure both cabin entrances were secure. Gabby, who I learned was a nurse, found a first aid kit for Claire, who regained consciousness. I cut them, Kurt said nonchalantly after he noticed Shane and Corey trying the phone lines and internet. I'm trying to keep this as quiet as possible. You're all struggling to realize that. The heck are you talking about? Tobias asked after a brief pause. Kurt took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. The people that I work for... A wild again, Claire said, unexpectedly walking up alongside and staring menacingly at Kurt. He works for a group called Wild Again. Kurt was silent for a few seconds before awkwardly nodding to confirm Claire's comments. Who are they? Tobias asked sternly. Kurt smirked. They'll keep this quiet if you prevent me from doing it. Who are they? I repeated demandingly. Tobias said to ask a third time before he finally responded. They're a hunting club. Elaborate, Tobias barked. Sighing, Kurt slowly hung his head, clearly apprehensive about revealing this information. They're a special kind of hunting club. A very, very unique, exclusive, secretive one. That sly smirk returned to his face. The group was supposedly found in Germany sometime in the 30s. They, they breed and raise humans, to be completely feral, primal with predatory animalistic instincts. They pump them with steroids, hormones, and other chemicals to manipulate their maturation rates, physical growth, bodily senses, and their brain development. 
My jaws dropped as we exchanged perturbed glances. Alda was clearly unsure how to respond. Why? Shane, who migrated over to us with Corey and Gabby, had asked. Think about it. For these elitist big game hunters who bagged every conceivable trophy out there, what better feat to pursue than an apex predator of their own kind? One that's smart and strong enough to hunt you back. It's the ultimate challenge for them. One that they'll pay top dollar for. Kurt nodded towards the door. They're simply called untamed. Those things outside that we're hiding from. They're wild Jagan's creations. They breed and raise them in controlled, cordoned off environments where they spend their days killing before being killed. Those things out there, they're humans. Actual human beings. Tobias asked excitedly, his grip tightening on his rifle. Kurt shrugged. Genetically, just as human as you and I. And this is the group you're loyal to? Gabby asked. I'm loyal to circumstance. Kurt quickly replied. I'm loyal to the moment. Kurt confirmed that Wild Jaken did indeed have a compound in this national forest. He said when Claire had infiltrated the property, she had entered through the hunting grounds and left an opening in the fence large enough for five untamed to escape through, before that it was discovered. Kurt and another mercenary, the man Devin and I had found earlier, were tasked with eliminating the escaped untamed. They disguised themselves as game wardens so they could roam about more freely, and despite being able to track them pretty handily, only killed just one of the five. Claire confronted Kurt about selling her baby to him seven years ago, who said that he had remembered the exchange. And to Claire's infuriation, he was very dismissive about the ordeal and returned to scrutinizing us for sabotaging his plans. I was going to focus on the untamed first and then deal with you guys after, Kurt said when explaining why he held Claire and I captive. One problem at a time. The other guy was dead white, but his dumbass getting killed forced me to do everything myself. He didn't know what he was getting into. And not for nothing. If you guys didn't screw up my bait station, your one friend would probably still be alive. You just made things worse by freeing him. You were using him as bait. Corey snapped, stepping towards Kurt, before Tobias held out his arm to keep him from advancing. <laughs> like I would actually let him die. Kurt replied pompously, rolling his eyes. I'm a marksman. I would have picked those guys off before they got anywhere near him but you all decided to screw it up. What happened to her? Claire asked in regards to her daughter. Kurt scoffed at the question. How am I supposed to know? That was seven years ago. I don't even do that kind of work anymore, getting new specimens. Kurt exclaimed, acting like Claire's question wasted his time. If what you saw outside is any indication, she's probably all messed up like they are by now. Assuming Shirdi hasn't been bagged by a client. And what are you going to do even if you find her? Recondition her to be normal when she never was in the first place. Gabby and I had to restrain Claire, who tried charging at Kurt. I'm sorry, but that's what happens when you stick your nose where you're not supposed to. Kurt said arrogantly, his cocky smirk only making Claire irate her. We had nothing to do with this. Corey angrily shouted. We were only doing our Bigfoot show. We were minding our own business. We got pulled into this unknowingly. Kurt burst out laughing. Well, now you know there are scarier and realer things in the woods to watch out for. Take me to the compound, Claire demanded, freeing herself from mine and Gabby's grips as she stomped towards Kurt. I know that's where she is. It took years, but I'm getting answers now, and I'm not leaving here without her. Pulling out a knife that she had concealed on her person, Claire pressed it against Kurt's neck. And so help me, if your people hurt her in any way, I'll start with you, she grumbled, the blade breaking skin on Kurt's neck and drawing blood. A few of us reminded Claire it wasn't possible to go anywhere right now, not with the untamed lurking outside, but she ignored our remarks, keeping completely focused on Kurt. Gabby tried urging Claire that he wasn't going anywhere, and he would answer to authorities when he got arrested which caused Kurt, who seemed amused by Claire's aggressive actions, to chuckle. I'll tell you what, Kurt said. I'll bring you if we get out of this alive. So, figure something out. Claire pressed the knife harder against Kurt's neck, 
while Gabby and Tobias begged her to stop. Just ignore him, Gabby pleaded, and clearly afraid Claire might do something bad. I know he's a bad man, but you'll be right back here where you started if you do anything to him, Tobias added. We've got things under control right now. Listen to them, Claire. Corey chimed in, locking his hands together to make a begging gesture. Claire didn't budge until the sounds of glass shattering came from upstairs, followed by thumping footsteps of more than one individual that moved in different directions. They were getting in sooner or later, Kurt said softly as Claire eased up on the knife against her neck. They're smarter, craftier, and more cunning than they appear. Don't underestimate them. This is practically an art form for them. They kill things just to kill them. While trying to track the footsteps overhead, everyone formed a tight circle around Kurt and Claire. Three thunderous bangs jolted the front door, followed by a deep grating roar-like scream that completely occupied our attention. Dropping from the catwalk directly above us was the child-sized untamed. It landed on Shane's shoulders, similar to how the other female had jumped on Brayden hooked one of her arms around his neck, and began furiously attacking him with a sharpened stick. Chaos ensued in response, during which the female untamed that attacked Brayden rushed down these stairs, blindly swinging her sharpened clawed fingernails. Shoot it! I heard Corey yell at Tobias who stood near Shane. Shane's frantic shrieks and cries filled the room, as blood spilled and spurted from his face and neck. Although shaking, Tobias nervously raised a rifle, looking like he was trying to set his aim as he loaded around into the chamber, while Corey and Claire repeatedly screamed for him to shoot. In what felt like the blink of an eye, the child-sized untamed jumped off Shane right before Tobias fired the rifle. Shane's entire jaw and right side of his face exploded in a plume of red mist from the shot, causing Gabby and I to start screaming hysterically as his body dropped to the floor. Tobias was in absolute shock, preventing him from noticing the adult female untamed, which tackled him and started fiercely slashing at his face and arms. At this moment, I realized the revolver was no longer in my possession. Panic set in while I manically scanned my surroundings as Tobias desperately cried for help, and Gabby screamed incoherently in the background. I spotted it near the front door, but Claire scooped up the gun first and didn't hesitate to empty its remaining rounds into the untamed on top of Tobias. Her thick crock of hair made it hard to see if and where any of Claire's shots had hit, but the untamed stiffened posture and its slowly falling over indisputably confirmed that it was dead. That's how you get him off someone, I heard Claire whisper, clearly referring to Tobias's fatal mishap of Shane. Claire and I got Tobias back up who suffered some serious wounds. The worst was a deep gash across his face that split open his left nostril, gums, and a side of his lip, which dangled off at the edge of his mouth. Where's Kurt? Corey asked, whose question made me freeze. Kurt was gone. Gabby pointed out that he left through the back way, which was now slightly ajar, and viewable from where we stood. Another rattling thud jolted the front door which started to splinter. Unconfident that the barricades would hold, we hurried towards the back door, during which we heard three more bashes come from the front. We managed to get outside before the front door finally broke down, and the large alpha male entered. Outside, however, the child-sized untamed stood between us and Claire, who was trembling uncontrollably. From where we stood, I noticed more details about the tinier female untamed, namely its deformed right arm, resembling two sausage links or an hourglass of a small section of her central right forearm became abnormally narrow, with any part beyond that point appeared completely limp, and covered with patches of grey brownish purple discoloration. The non-functional hand's short chubby appendages, however, did have what looked like different sized hooks and fingernails embedded in their stumps and lieu of fingertips. A flash caught my eye when the untamed shrugged its shoulders while slightly turning her right arm in our direction. My blood ran cold. I now understood why Claire who stood quivering with tears rolling down her cheeks was so emotionally paralyzed. The flash that caught my eye was a pink heart shaped charm. It dangled from a thin gold bracelet that made up the narrowed area of her disfigured forearm. 
The most disturbing detail was how the bracelet appeared, permanently embedded in her skin, whose arm apparently grew around the band, causing the malformation. Reminding myself she was a little girl, I whispered a soft, No, under my breath when I put everything together. This was Claire's daughter. She found her daughter. I was partially unnerved by the child and tame's grotesque face. The sides of her mouth had deep cuts into her cheeks, making it appear like she always brandished a wide, fleshy grin. It was what the untamed proudly perceived as a standoff. Claire was actually having perhaps the most revealing moment of her life, facing the morbid reality of her past actions and consequences. I'm sorry. I heard Claire whisper as she slowly dropped to her knees. I'm just so, so sorry that I did this to you. She started sobbing as the girl walked up to her, whose face's rabid hostile expression beamed with anticipation. Claire continued weeping and tightly embraced her daughter when she came within rage. Unfazed by Claire's affectionate gesture, the untamed didn't hesitate to bite into her neck. As the life slowly drained out of Claire's body, she looked accepting of her fate, like she had achieved peace of mind and a means of reciprocation for depriving her daughter of a chance to live a normal life. The child viciously extracted a mouthful of Claire's jugular, whose body went limp. And despite his grave injuries, Tobias screamed in anguish and broke away from us to make an already vain attempt to save his fiance. He managed to take just four or five steps before getting blindsided by the other male untamed, who had emerged from behind the cabin's natural gas tank. The being tackled Tobias to the ground and chomped down in his hand that he had extended towards Claire. The struggle made me jump into action. I grabbed a glass jar that I had spotted near the dumpster and raced towards Tobias, who had two of his fingers bitten off by the untamed. The fiend was exacerbating Tobias's facial wounds by slashing and digging his fingers into his gashes while he screamed and writhed on the ground, trying to escape from the monstrous fiend's unforgiving grasp. The untamed turned towards me at the last second when I ran up and jammed the glass shard in one of its oversized eyes. Shrieking in agony, the being fell off Tobias and desperately grabbed onto its face around the glass shard protruding from its eye as it wildly squirmed on the ground. Although Tobias was reeling from the additional trauma that he had suffered, I started dragging him away with Corey's help, who unexpectedly froze and looked back at the cabin. It's burning! Corey blurted out, pointing at the ranger station, from which black smoke was pouring out of the back entrance. Unless one of the untamed did it inadvertently, I suspected Kurt had started the fire as a distraction to help him escape, or destroy any evidence of what had happened that night. Probably both. I became alarmed when flames started emerging from the back door, which I realized was adjacent to the cabin's natural gas tank. We need to go, now. I barked at Corey while trying to keep Tobias moving, who could barely stand on his own. Before rounding the cabin, I looked back to see the untamed that had attacked Tobias was gone. The little girl, however, remained and continued playfully dismembering in Claire's body. She bit off so much of Claire's neck that her head was bent at an unnatural 90 degree angle. Her body made unsettling and grotesque twitch-like gestures. As the girl continued on, alternating with a sharpened stick and bare hands. Pausing, I blocked out Corey furiously asking me why I had stopped, and completely zoned in on Claire's daughter. It just wasn't right, I thought. This little girl should be an ordinary person, but wasn't given that life. Instead, she was brought into this unfathomable existence. I partly resented Claire for letting this happen to her own flesh and blood, while continuing to observe the girl's barbaric primal instincts in action. There really was no saving someone like this, I thought, getting overcome with a heavy sense of sorrow upon deducing. This little girl was inevitably doomed and unconformable. We can't just leave her here, let her live like this, I said softly, completely disregarding the burning cabin. What are you talking about? Corey asked anxiously, while readjusting his grip on Tobias. We need to put her out of her misery, I said woefully. I mean, look at her. 
What person deserves to live like that? And a little kid no less. She doesn't even know that she's human. The untamed noticed me watching while she was rubbing her pointed stick up and down Claire's exposed ribcage. Snarling at me, her disfigured face darkened as she made hostile, low-sounding growls, while flashing her teeth like dogs do in standoffs. She started advancing towards us, shifting between walking bipedally or crawling on all fours. I blacked out Corey's frantic cries telling me to run, and heard him shuffle off with Tobias. And despite the ravenous desire to kill in her eyes, the kind of ferocity you typically only see in an animal stare, I wasn't afraid of the little girl. Whether it was the pity I had felt for this reprehensibly tragic outcome, or the strong sense of guilt experienced out of seeming obligation to continue Claire's remorse on our behalf, I remained where I stood. Upon coming within three or four yards, the girl started moving in like a large circle around me, shifting in a sideways crab-like crawl on all fours, whose movements looked too unnatural for an actual human to make. She was clearly waiting for the right opportunity to pounce, during which she continued growling and snarling while moving in that orbital motion, keeping her front side facing me the whole time. The untamed was about to rise from standing on all fours, when a loud crackling boom rang out, causing my ears to ring. When I looked back at the little girl, there was a baseball-sized opening in the center of her chest. I watched its eyes roll in the back of her head as the life escaped her monstrous face, as the untame dropped back on all fours before collapsing on her side. I looked behind me and saw Gabby standing a few yards away, holding Kurt's rifle. She started jogging in my direction, urging me to get away from the cabin. Flames continued shooting out from the back doorway, and they were beginning to envelop the gas tank. My dire sense of urgency returned as I gave the body of Claire's daughter one last glance before making my way around to the front of the cabin. Smoke poured from under the crevices of the ranger station's front door and the window shutters, while an orangey glow came from the second story windows. Scanning the vicinity for Tobias and Corey, I quickly noticed the smears and splatter marks of blood along with other bodily pieces scattered across the cabin's front porch, the wooden ramp, and the dirt lot. There was a large hunk of meat wearing tattered remnants of clothing on the ramp that I quickly identified as Braden's remains, who they had tore to pieces. Before adequately processing the macabre scene, Gabby and I stood before her. My eyes drifted towards Braden's truck, which was our best means of escape. Corey emerged from the other side with a worried look across his face and confirmed what I already dreaded. Oh, we don't have the keys, he exclaimed, gesturing towards the car with his hand as he came up to myself and Gabby. It's unlocked. I got Tobias in, but he's in really bad shape. And Brayden, he still had the keys. Corey's voice faded as he visually acknowledged what remained of Brayden's body. The three of us looked at each other, knowing a search of his body with time not on our side was inevitable. We warily moved towards the ramp where Braden's body lay, our cautious approach largely influenced by the hands-on task we were about to perform, and then the sweltering heat and flames now seeping out from under the cabin's front door. Forming a semicircle around Braden's body, we hurriedly inspected it and the surrounding area obviously hoping to see the keys laying somewhere so we wouldn't have to start sifting through the body's pockets. There, Gabby said softly, gesturing towards the bushes growing alongside the ramp. Gabby pointed at Brayden's severed hand, which tightly clenched his truck's keys. Initially scrambling away from the severed limb, Corey, who was the closest, turned back and looked at us, knowing that he had no choice. Taking a slow breath, he pressed down on the hand-severed end with his foot, while unraveling its stiff fingers to obtain the truck keys. Corey's face was green when he had retrieved them, and started running towards the truck but stopped about halfway to vomit. After his episode concluded, Corey reached the truck, but abruptly stiffened and grabbed onto the sides of his head with both hands. No, Corey murmured, his face filling with dismay. When I realized what Corey was reacting to, my heart sank. We didn't realize it earlier but all four of the truck's tires were flat. While coping with this crippling setback and realizing our only way out of these woods was now on foot, 
A rush of fury swept through me as I envisioned the individual who was definitely responsible. Kurt. That son of a... I whispered under my breath. Looking at Gabby and Corey, who both had wide-eyed aghast expressions of trepidation and uncertainty. We walked around to the passenger side where Corey loaded Tobias in the back and were greeted to a grisly scene. Blood was splattered across the vehicle's entire side, and its back door was wide open. Along the tree line, we saw the alpha male untamed standing over Tobias who lay face down. Whether he was conscious, we'll never know, as we helplessly watched the alpha male grab Tobias' head and make a series of sharp, twisting motions, completely turning it like he was removing a bottle cap. Each turn produced a series of squishes, crunches, and pops, while the hulking untamed stared at us with a deranged, maniacal expression, clearly exhibiting the pleasure it got from killing Tobias. Corey screamed for Gabby to shoot the bean when it finally severed Tobias' head, which he began to inspect with majesty and wonder. And despite her shaking limbs, Gabby unsteadily took aim and fired a round that managed to strike the untamed's swollen shoulder. Dropping Tobias' head, the fiend recoiled as it shrieked in affliction, pressing its massive hand over the gunshot wound as it angrily faced our direction. Stepping forward, the alpha male looked ready to charge, but tensed up and appeared to gaze beyond us, the frenzied look in his face quickly fading as it appeared to contemplate its next actions. While Gabby struggled to discharge the empty round she fired, the alpha male snarled at us one last time and scampered off into the forest. We looked at each other in bewilderment for a few seconds, before turning to see what the untamed had reacted to, the flame engulfed cabin. No sooner than we all faced the ranger station, we heard a high-pitched hissing that instantly reminded us of the natural gas tank. With no other options, we sprinted from the burning ranger station. My estimate we got about 15 to 20 yards before the tank finally blew, consuming the cabin in a giant fireball that ejected millions of debris pieces in every direction. The deafening and explosion's ferocity threw me into a muddy ditch alongside the road, getting dazed from the harsh impact as my body slammed into the ground. Unable to move, I stared out into the woods, focusing on a ridgeline about 100 feet from the road. I don't know what I saw next or if it had anything to do with what happened to us, but just as I had spotted it, a solid black humanoid figure with a round cone-shaped head ducked behind the rocky ridgeline. I couldn't make out any more details. It definitely wasn't an untamed, and it looked too broad to be a person. The lighting wasn't spectacular and I may have only imagined it, but I didn't dwell on it for long at the time as I quickly became occupied with the sense of feeling returning in my limbs. Looking back at that moment, however, maybe just maybe I actually saw what we originally came here to try and find. It's hard to say. The blast attracted enough attention for someone to send help, which took over an hour to arrive. We were treated for our injuries and gave testimony on our versions of what had happened that night. Despite our correlating stories, the absence of definitive evidence, at least according to authorities who seemed skeptical, made our accounts impossible to verify. The remains of Mitra Devon were never found, nor was there any mention of the untamed or other identified creatures in the final report. It officially stated the explosion was caused by a heated system malfunction that happened to occur just as the SCAR team arrived at the ranger station to report their team members, Mitch and Devon, missing. The report stated we came across to Gabby and Tobias whose car broke down and gave them a ride. Perhaps what bothered me most was after reading through the final report, I noticed that there was no mention of Claire or her missing daughter. Any efforts to reveal what actually happened that night were futile. As far as I know, the untamed that got away are still lurking in those woods. Kurt is probably still working for the mysterious Wild Jaeger organization and might have succeeded in hunting down the remained untamed for all I know. I've tried contacting Gabby and Corey, but neither are willing to revisit that night. It's hard to function regularly knowing a heinous organization like Wild Jagan exists, whose sole purpose is turning innocent unsuspecting humans into monstrous predatory game that gets hunted for sport. I wonder how many untamed have been deprived of a normal life, and turned into these vicious, feral beings that if anything, 
shed light on how close we as humans are to our primeval origins. Seeing what I saw and knowing what I know for me, this story, which started with covering a group of amateur Bigfoot researchers, was far from over. The events of that fateful night only scratched the surface of this dark, hidden truth. Thank you all very much for listening to today's stories. I hope you enjoyed them. Wherever you may be in the world, I hope that you have a great day or night. Stay safe out there. And as always, stay creepy.